Welcome back to the Dynasty Row. My name is Pierre Howard at Pierre Howdy on Twitter. I've been here since 9.30. I don't know what you're talking about, and that clock is a lie. Uh, we do this every week at Wednesday, because today's not Monday, at 9.30 p.m., uh, where we talk about, answer, think about out loud, anything to do with Dynasty or fantasy football in general. If you have any thoughts, comments, questions about any of that, please drop them on whatever comment box or whatever streaming platform you happen to maybe catch us on if you're still around after, you know, we were on time. So, Zach, to continue the conversation we've been having for about an hour now. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, and like I was just saying about my rookie ranks, I, I think I've got my pre-draft rookie ranks locked in. I think I'm feeling less passionate about, I know there's players that I probably will want to have taken a look at at this point. Um, but I'm more willing to let those players emerge with the draft and the draft coverage and who gets undrafted. And, uh, and talked about as an undrafted free agent and then I have been most years because I figured out um I, I I think I should just trust the players that stick out to me and I go and take a look at aren't always the ones or oh, really um but I tend to catch a lot of the ones that are gonna end up being drafted being of interest and the ones that slip through no, as normally slipping through because the, the simple answer is they're slipping through because they didn't do much that triggers something interesting for me. So right. my 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 look when they turn up is going to be that. I already know what I'm going to find um, or some version of what I'm going to find. And I'm just going to have to adjust to the, I know I don't know everything. They're all going to go into that kind of bucket. And I'm going to have to listen to other people anyway. And so, yeah, um, the off-season outside of, doing rookie profiles and where I'm not making a lot of content on it this off season. I'm not doing a video player or a video for three players or alliterating the process um, outside of the podcast I've done. I feel a lot less pressure this year, but it also makes me feel a lot more, uh, how did you say it? Uh, this is all navel gazing. Yeah. I guess that's just my general attitude in general. My things turn out not to be true in fantasy football. And so I tend to take a less a fair approach is the way I think about it. But the navel gazing thing works. And well, how you come along? Yeah, I think to the the way things are now, the landscape of dynasty. There are so many people running out such like strong, solidified takes. Uh, even if they're not solidified, even if even if people don't want to admit that they may not actually know uh, everything just yet, and the more I the more I watch that process kind of unfold, the less it makes me want to run out and shout uh, takes. I don't know, and it, because right. I, like we have, and it's this is part of part of I think what makes this fun for me is I know that there are going to be spots where I'm going to be wrong. I know I like I already know that. I know that there are going to be yeah. players that I'm wrong on. And the fun thing for me is trying to identify by looking back at my previous uh classes that I've I've seen <laughs> How's it going, Bob? Bob Bob is the video maven. He is uh amazing. <laughs> Uh, and and like the fantasy cares stuff, the Scott Fishbowl stuff is starting to roll out hot and heavy, and it's fantastic. But what I like it, it to me the the new landscape of you got to be first, you got to be loudest, you got to have the hottest take uh, makes me want to sit back and kind of watch more. It makes me want to not hot take in it and it again because i know i'm going to be wrong and because like it, the most valuable part of this process is identifying to me where we get it wrong and then why and whether or not it's something that we can account for in future classes or if it's just a 
I have no idea how to. I mean, Puka Nakua last year, and everyone's going to look for the next Puka. I don't know how to find Puka Nakua. He didn't have a lot of tape that I was excited about. He didn't have much for you to look at except for what was it? Yards well, no, pass <laughs> attempt in a his per it was kind of a per touch efficiency argument that people like. Yeah, yeah but but which again, has what now worked we out at, once. So that's cool. yeah, but but if we, yeah, if we look at per touch efficiency and then you increase touches, efficiency normally goes down and they kind of become what everyone else like it's the efficiency yeah. efficiency and volume don't usually go hand in hand i mean it's the the reason why people are i think maybe a little over the top on somebody like a chan who is awesome like and and he will continue to be very good that offense is tailor made to have somebody who is very fast who can hit a one cut and go but by the same token if you increase his touches you necessarily decrease the number of touches that he gets in a perfect situation. And so all of a sudden the efficiency goes down. I mean, it, that it's hard for me to see somebody like Puka Nakua where I could, I could not watching his film. Like he was fine. I'm not saying he was a bad player, but he was not somebody who popped for me. He didn't pop. Anybody that I listened to for analytics, he didn't pop. He did pop for the, you know, the five or six guys that I know who went to the Senior Bowl over the course of three days, which is a very I think the Senior Bowl is a really interesting lens to go to jump in just for a second because it's the type of thing that when it works, it sounds like it makes sense, feels like it worked, and so you want to just start looking at senior bowl uh, or whatever yeah. it is uh kickoffs but the thing is is that it probably didn't work there's just a small sample and that's why small yeah. samples can be frustrating it like it's feel like it worked and it makes sense why won't you just like it because same thing with uh, and that's why i say it's an interesting place to point in because it's almost the exact same thing about a statistical argument that you could have made some people could have made and probably did it's a you would have wasted a lot of time, effort, and draft capital on um, missing. And now that you think that works, you are almost yeah. obligated, but you're not because most people arguing for it saw something they liked, went on, it worked, and they won't see it again because it's not there again, maybe. Um, to keep doing that, and that's where my process is based on. I want to make decisions consistently with good reasons. I'm willing to change them and find new reasons to make different decisions, but I want to be hitting consistently above average and doing better and improving and knowing more about what can and should be expected to happen. Um, whereas I think more people, uh, people that think that way are more six shooting wild westing types. I'm going to, I'm going to fire it out and I, I'll hit more targets than everyone else. I'm like, I don't think I'm a genius. That's ultimately where we come down to. You think at some level you can catch luck or genius enough to win. Yeah. And I don't, I, I think fantasy is good enough. I think the players I play with enough that relying on my lack of genius or luck is just basically useless and fruitless for me. Um, but maybe maybe some people have have that and go go. But it's not something you can teach other people or say listen to me all the time, because yeah, as we know with that kind of luck, it's hard hard to replace. You don't know when it's going to hit. You don't know when it's going to miss. You just have to do it based on someone else's say so. And I'm just not. I'm I'm trying to play my game. I don't want to. I missed a tweet from someone and now I didn't get it this year. Like and, oh, fuck, fuck you. And <laughs> not <be> honest. <laughs> not not only not only is it luck in like seeing them in that small sample size at senior bowl but it's also luck in like he fell into the perfect situation he had the perfect set of injuries in front of like all of this stuff happened and and i think you're, you're gonna see people run out like ricky pearsall and and roman wilson and lad mcconkey to some extent because they all had very good senior bowl weeks and, and good per touch efficiency. Yeah, and, and again, like they're not bad players. I have them. I mean, it, this class is is 
This class is interesting. The, the the top end is really good. The top two are really good. The top five for me are well, the top two are exceptional. The top five are really good. And then you get into a whole bunch of like, I want to like these guys more than I do. But think, some of them are going to succeed. I'm right. Some are good and good evaluators and just got a good evaluation. And they would be willing to admit. See, the part that that doesn't allow for is I have to admit that at some point and some way, Laquan Treadwell, Philip Dorsett, all the, all the misses I've seen coming could have hit. Because yeah. like you said, there's more going into it. Yeah. Perfect situation is situation is a thing we think we can use. I don't think it is, but I do understand how reality has a, there were more variables, right? So a right player in the right situation. And I think honestly, with some players less draft capital in some cases could have led to better outcomes for that person because reality is complex, you know? Yeah. And but if you you're thinking the other direction. Uh, on the other process, I outlined the six shooter. I just see the right things, or I just find the right things, <laughs> and you can't allow for that. He hit because he was going to hit, and um, but the ones who actually you know have a process or are pretty solid evaluators also can admit that you know there's a world in which Puka Nakua doesn't hit, and um, and I don't think you'll find many of us on the same on that bus if you know what i mean the right. that uh, puga hits and puga misses and i said this at the time and i always say it like i like you just said i'm never going to see a puka nakua coming and because of the history and the way that i think i understand the way prospects hit and don't i'm good with that because i know i have to let a certain percentage go i'm not gonna see anything that makes them stand out but i can accept it when i see it it's the best i got with reservations. Um, if, if there's reservations in the rookie profile year, at least. Um, but yeah, that's as good as I can do. That's as good as I can find we can reasonably expect to do. The idea you're always going to find the right player is just, you know, it's just not going to happen. But I can say some people are genuine. I don't yeah. know how to pluralize that. <laughs> I, I would uh, uh, my take is watch Zach and Peter and J Mike and don't. Do not pretend I know the rookie names. I really don't. I was really impressed with myself the other day. And I, I, I still think it's got to be frustrating to someone like Travis May, who puts <laughs> in, who knows so much about college. And I go through a three-week span of, those are fake names. Stop bothering me with people that don't exist. To he puts out a poll and says, I don't know who the chalk's going to be here. And I say, it's probably going to be these six. And he's like, yeah, you're probably right. That's got to be frustrating for a guy who knows I didn't know their names or any, and I still couldn't identify him in a line stuff, lineup three weeks ago. Like all that work he's put in over the last four years understanding these players, and I can at least narrow it down to the same six after a couple of weeks' work. That's my personal victory. That's that's how I know I have peaked. <laughs> that's, that's as good as I can do. Um, but uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know any of these rookie names. And honestly, like I say, I'm still open to the draft bringing more in that I haven't looked at. Um, but like I said, Zach, they're going to go into a big bag of, I probably know I'm not going to find positive things on their profile, but I don't know everything. So I'm going to try to just uh, based on where everyone else has them. Because some people know things I don't. <laughs> um, how are you evaluating former rugby stars? I saw this <laughs> question a little while ago, so I actually had a, a, a little time to think about it. Um, it's really fun, but I think where I'm going to take it is, the, or the prior that I have that applies to these situations is one, we're not getting stars. We're getting a couple pretty shiny stars, and I don't know rugby that well, but I get the impression we're not getting the stars because I really do think there's, you know, top performers in one sport moving to another sport outside of Michael uh, Jordan just trying it after he's finished with the NBA. It's going to be pretty weird because why would you move? Um, and I do like the idea, there was a commercial back freaking way too long ago because I'm old, of an a, a, a English football star teaching an English rugby star or a Welsh rugby star how to do their different kicks. And, and I can't even remember what the commercial was about, um, but it did spur a conversation between me and my friend of whether your culture pushes you towards one sport or the other from where you're born and where you, you're from. And that's actually true. Um, in the history of sports, like the, the changing face of basketball, for example, it's culturally driven. It used to be a bunch of Jewish kids, literally. That's yeah. where the, 
basketball history starts from. And now it's not. And a lot of bad genetic arguments have come up, but it's much more to do with cultural priorities and cultural shifts in what people think of as good, uh, uh, good things to pursue and also avenues to getting out of the situation, presumably. Um, but it's the same with uh, rugby on English football. It's like, how much is it that a good footballer would be a great rugby star and vice versa? Or in this case, a great rugby star or a great American football star. But the thing you've got to understand about rugby is they're coming from smaller populations. And I really do think the American population could be underestimated when looking at European sports. Like, it still makes no sense to me. You all suck at football unless you're a girl. Girls kick ass. Literally top tier world all time <laughs> and the men suck but it's probably because again of that cultural i'm going too far into this that's not where the best athletes go i do think there's an element to that having said that my prior that i pull in for these kind of situations is the nfl is not a developmental league they're a pr stunt league sure but they're not bringing someone in to teach them american football and that means they are starting very far back yeah, even if they get an opportunity, I think even a great athlete at rugby, you're really starting behind the eight ball. Again, you're looking at like Tyree Kill of players who didn't play a lot in college and then succeeded in the NFL. It's a very particular situation. There's been a clear difference made by a team to focus on an individual player, and he still would have been washed out at some point if he failed to hit a mark. And they're really rare where you can see development happen once a player gets to the NFL. And even then, Terry Kill has been playing football his whole life by the time he gets into that situation. And as similar as the sports could be argued to be, I think you're you're not starting like in last place. You're starting in a different race in a different city that you have to win before you can get to join the race to be an NFL starter. And they've already started before the same time your race has started, if you know what I mean. Like, you're, you're really fighting uphill. Um, but it would be fun. And I think the NFL will give a few, they give guys a shot like they have done before because it is a PR stunt league. Maybe it'll bring in some more Europeans to watch, would be the thought. JV and Baker season. Javon. Yeah, I have, a, I have, he's, he's my next watch, Bradley. I, I haven't got there yet. I'm finishing up Jamari Thrash. Uh, I've done some Pearsall. It's, it's been a big week, but but he is on the docket. Uh, and again, a name that people uh, have been talking about. There's been a steady drumbeat of Javon Baker. Yeah, he didn't stand out for me. I should probably take a second look, I guess. Um, because I think I've seen that name as well, but. We get three, five party hot guys this week, but it's a it's a tandem <laughs> five with Dave nice. and Anthony. Going Dave for and it, Anthony, so. yeah. Do Nick's Panics end up first round uh, of Super Flights in mid to late first round count? It, it depends where they get drafted. To be honest with you, um, arguably if they get first round draft capital, they could late first, early second. I don't think I'm going for it. But maybe I don't. I don't think they do. Uh, I mean, I, I guess like you could you could make an argument there, at like one eleven, one twelve. But also, if you look at the way things are falling right now, Xavier Worthy's down in that right. Like, there's some very talented players down in in that range. It's a it's a deep class, and I look. I think Penix is probably going to struggle at the at the next level. And I've never really been a big Bo Nix fan. I know that he had a great year this past year. I'm going to have to do more film work on the two of them, but I don't think that – I'm not even convinced that there are four quarterbacks that I'm interested in. And, in fact, like, J.J. McCarthy has been pushed up so far beyond like it's wild it, it's absolutely wild yeah we're in that point in the off season I, I said it the other day reading my timeline i've decided it's time i spend less time reading my timeline and more time trying to do something else with fantasy right now because the, the timeline's got a hold of it and 
we burned through ro actual rookie content real quick. I actually did see a few pieces of really interesting work going on that I haven't seen before, but most of it is maybe if I say it this year, I will be the one to have invented it and I will be the hero type stuff. It's like, yeah, thanks for telling me something we knew 12 years ago. Fucking fantastic. Hope you get them follows. Um, or uh, it's just I'm bored of what we know we, know we should know let's go looking for a hot take kind of a yeah. or or the the unexpected um and if i say enough names eventually one of them pay off or if i say a name maybe it'll pay off and i'll look like a genius kind of <laughs> timeline era right now you know what i mean like we're we're, we're we're into the that guy's phone case color might mean something and um, period of evaluation that, that's that's how low we are right now. Well, they're interesting. Um, uh, they haven't stood out to this point for good reasons. Um, if the NFL drafts them higher than we expect, yes, they'll become infinitely more interesting, uh, especially in a Superflex rookie draft. But for right now, we hold our course kind of thing. And while investigating, I'm not saying don't look closer at those players by any means, but, you know, uh, you know, perhaps. Don't over evaluate because of the lack of new news. Because we, I tell you every year, don't get too hungry for it. Because we burn through rookies real quick and then spend three months trying to find other things to say, and we can end up overthinking. <laughs> it's it, it's a little bit like uh, startup season, where like everybody is is wanting startups, wanting to get in a draft, and then you get in a draft, and everyone's like, "You're on the clock! You're on the clock! You're on the clock!" And then it's done, and then and everyone's then like, for, "Oh, yeah, I yeah. wish we had a draft." Yeah. The rookie season is a little bit like that. Where Let's like do every, another draft. Yeah, everybody wants all in the information so fast. Andrew, is this rookie running back class really as bad as people are saying? Depends what they're saying and how they're saying it. it. Zach, you go. I've been babbling it, on. So I, think I don't. So I, I think it's that's a an interesting question, and it is has got multi. Uh, it's it's as uh, Theo Epstein was wont to say when he was the Red Sox GM. It's multifactorial. There are a lot of pieces to this. So I, I don't think it's a great that's class. I think that this class starts about where to give you a frame of reference, like Zach Charbonnet and Roshan Johnson and that like that group last year. So. So there's no Bijan, there's no Gibbs. It's like tier three, and that's where this class starts. But there are like five or six players, I think, in that tier, that first tier that like are okay. And a lot of this is going to get dictated by landing spot. A lot of it's going to get dictated by draft capital. And some of it's going to be dictated by the fact that We've got a lot of really good running backs in the NFL right now who are in backfields. And so they're some of these players are going to land with incumbent backs that they don't have the talent to overtake. The other piece of this running back class being bad is that there are a lot of guys who are very similar in in talent, all even though they do different things. And so it's really hard to pin down the players that we like, there's nobody who has separated themselves. And so rather than sit there and admit that, look, there are five or six players that we like, but we don't know which ones are going to be successful. We just say it's a bad class. Which, yeah, I agree with everything Zach just said. The other part of it that Zach's leading up to is if everyone hates this class hard enough, suddenly it will be a really good class for fantasy. If you know what I mean? Um, here's my way into it. When was the last, and not that we're comping the class, but when was the last bad draft class by our definition at running back? The last, yeah. Last year was an X. We had two great prospects. We were really excited about them, and Devin showed up. Hmm? 2019? 2013? 2019. 2019 was pretty bad. I'll agree with that. Yeah. And I mean, so there are three players from the 2019 class that have one top 12 season. We also have five top 12 seasons from the running back class in 2019 and 17 top 24 seasons. Now, they might be from multiples of the same person. But what I'm trying to highlight is even in a bad class, there's viable fantasy starters at some point through the first few years of their career. Now, some of them are Devontae Freeman, where you see it and then you never see it again. 
apart from I'll never see it quite as great again. Um, some of them, like David Johnson as well, same story as the Freeman, where we thought there was more and then there was an injury and he was one of my favorite players, still is, to be honest. And it just never quite worked out after that initial um, greatness uh, that we saw that towards the end of his rookie season. Um, but bad class is relative in that sense. Even if it is actually a terrible class and we're get, just getting mediocre hits, there's still hits. And lots of them have top 12 in the range of outcomes. So that's the part we're pointing out by, depending on how hard everyone's hating on it, we might want to go in on it a little bit in Dynasty or Fantasy because there's going to be points scored here. Even a bad class has viable players um, for multiple years or multiple top 12 years for that fact. And that's all I was going to add to that. Zach said all the good stuff, so I thought I'd <laughs> picture something that I have in a table, handy table. Because, um, yeah, you know, no one stands out, like Zach said, like Bajon or Gibbs that are easy to profile. And I've come to think of good or bad draft classes as those that are easy to recognize or hard to recognize, easy to distinguish the better from the worse. And last year was good for that. The year before that, that was great. The, the, the phrase I've become to hate the most, almost like maybe in Superflex, is... Um, I've forgotten. Shit, I was literally just going to say it. Um... Oh, the next 2014 class, because we already had it, if anyone wasn't paying attention. 2021 was the next class like 2014. One, easy to profile, great players, really deep, up to six and seven players. Do they have as many top 12 seasons at this point in their season as 2014 class? No, because that class is really irre irreplicable. But the difference between the two isn't really the numbers to this point in their career, and they, they haven't quite got that far into their career so maybe they'll catch up it's that in 2014 we're at a place in dynasty where the king was third year breakout what third year breakout wide receiver despite the fact that you could have known that was wrong back in 2000 let alone 2014 there wasn't a plethora of data nerds like myself giving away the tables at that point or as many of us maybe or maybe we weren't as loud i don't know um, and also the undervaluation of rookie wide receivers and what they do in their first year and how much we can know about them in their first year. Because they didn't hit the top 12 and top 24 that first year. Mike Evans, Otto Beckham, they weren't hitting the top 24. They hit the top 36-ish, and it was the way they finished the year so strongly. We saw that bump with what they were going to be, which meant that a lot of people got them really late in the first round, maybe early second round. And there was a Sammy Watkins sitting at the top of the class, which drove a lot of them further down. A lot of people wasted draft capital on Sammy Watkins, it turns out. And someone else got Odo Beckham, which was one of the best hits in a rookie draft, I think, still ever, in terms of uh, how many point different points making you got and for how long. So 2014 classes are replicable, not because of the number or strength of the hits, because 2021 did that. And no one's talking like, who's the next 2021 draft class? We, it just kind of was like, oh, that's a good year. And since then, we've been talking about how good the rookie wide receiver classes are who have been more disappointing than 2021, I'll point out. But still, they've been pretty good. And the real difference was the experience of 2014. They came cheaper. They came in late towards the end of their first year, which those two myths were still very prevalent in our community at that point. And so it felt like it was unexpected, even though, yeah, we just kind of we were miss representing the possibility of that i think writ large um or at least that's a sense i got because at that point i was a newbie to dynasty and that's what i thought so the easy to access most common content was telling me those two things i'm sure if you're reading adam hartstead at that point you knew better but but you know we're not talking about the elites we're talking about what you got from cbs espn and that's who i was listening to and they they didn't they did not know <laughs> <laughs> and so it came as a shock to the vast majority because that's where most of us got our, and still get our content from. Um, so what is a good and bad class uh, is a really interesting question. At wide receiver and running back, and I think that part of it is also underrated. The experience of it and where we're at in our process as a community tends to have an effect on that. Anyway, I, I hate the what's the next 2014 wide receiver class. Not to hate on what you said about this class that's an entirely separate thing because they're meaning it like they they mean it different when they say it's a
damn it. <laughs> yeah. Well, and it's yeah, it's not a one for like it's not a it's never gonna be a one for one, but like to me, there's a real no. good top end. The, like when you have five wide receivers, no, in I class, think with you, like, even from 2021, we're like, but like, like when, that's when what you, I was meaning by everyone's talking about we're in this great rookie period, and we kind of are, but yeah. not how you think. We're kind of due for some um, good young rookie players. We're due for more breakouts in fourth and fifth year careers. But again, that speaks to the 2014 rookies didn't break out by my definition in their rookie year. It was really seeing how much they could do towards the end of that season. But sorry, carry on. You say words, Nick. Uh, no, I was just going to say when you have when you have five wide receivers in a class that that I go and watch film and and I'm excited about. Like that is right. Like that does not happen very often. Like usually it's like right. two, and then I'm like, eh, okay, this is like two, and then three more, and then we're like, yeah, nice. there's yeah, some, yeah that, there are some other. Pl- so this is like two and a half times deeper than normal. Like we're here, we are. I tell you what, that's something that is relevant to these questions in this era right now. This is a period of the year last year where we were trying to defend the 2023 draft class. Do you remember yeah. that? Because everyone got bored of it and went yeah. looking for maybe new, exciting ideas, and it was this class was disappointing compared yeah. to what it was built up into. And like I said, most of my league winners, the people that won my league, if it wasn't me, and even if it was me, largely built around the 2023 class. <laughs> like That's yeah. who was winning most leagues. And it was not, it was oversold for three years, basically, but it didn't make it any less of a good class. It's just, we got tired of it and started talking about maybe there's no one good here. And, and yeah, it was pretty good, partly because of CJ Stroud and and, uh, Sam Laporta, don't get me wrong, but still. But but again, like that's part of identifying a good class, like identifying a good class is saying, okay, what, what are the fantasy relevant positions in, in, dynasty and if you're playing super flex it's quarterback if you have any Absolutely. sort of tight end premium a top tier tight end sets you apart and even if you don't a top tier tight end is a way to gain a positional advantage at a position where most teams don't have a top tier tight end just because there aren't very many and then you've got you know running backs and wide receivers so if, if you have a a thick top tier of quarterback if you have anything for a top tier of tight end that looks like it could be a top tier tight end, and then you have running backs and wide receivers, that class is by definition deep. It may not, it may not produce the number of you know top 12 seasons, but like man, you can look at that and it and it makes the makes the first round more valuable because it spreads that out. You get quarterbacks at the top, and that it, you know necessarily pushes more valuable talented players toward the back end of this like there are again probably three quarterbacks that are going to be drafted in the top three picks of the nfl draft i keep hearing jj mccarthy's name thrown out there as maybe maybe trading up to four to get him so if four quarterbacks go in the first four picks of the nfl draft there are going to be four quarterbacks in in super flex rookie draft uh first rounds All, so so already your your four picks in i mean you're not necessarily the the first four but the, your four picks in the first round are going to be quarterbacks high value position we've already got Brock Bauer so now you're at five people are very uh in on Marvin Harrison Jr. Malik Neighbors so now you are at Brock Bauer. 6 7 a lot of people are in on Odunze. Now you're at eight. That is a ridiculously deep class, and you haven't even talked about running backs at all yet. You probably shouldn't talk about running backs at all yet. But we're eight picks in. That's a that's a deep class. So sorry. Now we got to answer. No, it with- seems like um, I like the fact that the things we say translate to the new narratives if you know what i mean that's how i know they're doing pretty well or we're doing pretty well at saying what we're trying to say it's not that the idea changes you just say see here is the same idea in this draft class with a new narrative and i'm sorry i'm getting a little obsessed with language here but 
I think that's good. I, I, I remember saying similar things in the opposite way about last year, how it's a good class because we have seven of really yeah. interesting players, not because we have 24. Right. Like, calm down. And, and that's, the, that's the thing. Like, And you hear people say, oh, second round picks are going to be first round picks in this class. No, they're not. But there are going to be eight first round picks that are first round picks. Which is which big is pretty because exciting. Usually there aren't eight first round picks that are first round picks. Usually there are like and four. That that's the thing that I think people get twisted up of, especially the gunslinger uh, type analysts. Because they're like, see, Devin A. Chain, Puka Nakua could have got him in the second round. I told you. And like you're just, you're misrepresenting how likely you were to get those two. You yeah. know? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Anyway, um, let's see. What I was gonna say, it, it looks like we're doing quarterback at least a little bit here because EJD's got some Information for us. Oh, I looked at the film of the QBs, and Nick's is the most accurate hits receivers on the run. Nick, um, Nick's, Nick's threw more screen passes than any player that I have ever charted, and also had an absolute elite separator down the field. Like, yes, he he, but I think you'll also find like if you if you watch. Um, if you watch film on Troy Franklin, you say Nix was hitting receivers on the run and in stride. Troy Franklin was not very good yards after the catch. And some of that is on a quarterback. And so, like, yes, he was he was good at getting Franklin deep downfield, but I don't uh he he's fine. But I like I'm not I'm not at a point where I'm really excited about Bo Nix for you know I would go to fine yeah and, and just quick yeah, he's okay top, like he's off the if he, if he gets capital he, I can see where it comes from like the completion percentage for his career is like 65 percent the average is 63 for a good passer yeah but like you were saying about a dot if you adjust that by completion percentage he's about two percent above average but the average hit is about three percent above average and I'm not I don't want a number go green it. It's just a point. He's doing well. He's not, he's not doing spectacularly well. Um, and and some of that has to do with the type it, of passes he's throwing. According to Zach and Sipo kind of tells the same story. His accuracy rating average for his career is about 75, which is pretty good. But again, that's not really well, adjusted for the type of passes he's throwing. And yeah. part of it, too, for me is that because I watched the entirety of a career, like – I ha I still have like I watched Auburn Bo Nix, which was ugly. And so like, and yes, this, progression and yes, like, but also the not not quite the same conference as the SEC. It, it, you know, different like easier thought like not to denigrate Nix, not to say that he's bad, but. I like I don't think he's in the I don't think he's in the conversation with the top four guys. And all of a sudden, if you're at quarterback five and and six in a class, things start to get pretty thin. Cause if we get two quarterbacks out of this class, that's gonna be a banner, a banner here. <laughs> and and just to alliterate something, uh or elucidate even something else I was saying before, how we can get locked onto profiles that we like and go looking for them and you miss more than you hit two players with almost identical stats one that i just read bo nix but if you really like any of the stuff i just mentioned about bo nix slightly above average sepo um at completion percentage 65 which is above average and uh career adjusted rate is also over 75 for both of them which is above average for a quarterback coming from where they're coming from and um, tana mordecai who i've never heard of and i doubt anyone else will say almost identical stats across those three yeah. or four very common reference accuracy completion rate. That's not telling you they're great. And now EJD is saying he's watch, which is where I point out that watching is very different. I'm not saying, and therefore what you saw is wrong. But if right. anyone's making a statistical argument, he compares to other. But, uh, but, but it also, it also kind of depends on, and, and, EJD, I don't know how you watch, but it also depends on how you watch because it's easy to watch players. And if you're not if you're not tracking everything that happens, it's easy to see 
things and go, oh yeah, that's what he does. But like, like I'll do that. Like I'll sit there and go, man, it looks like he's doing this. And then I'll go back and look at what I've charted and go, no, no, he's not. He's not doing that. He's doing this. And so it's easy to kind of see, you know, two or three highlight plays where like Nick's will hit somebody on a slant and all of a sudden that'll be a 50 yard touchdown. You're like, Oh, he hits guys in stride, but he did that, you know, this specific instance. And then the next four he did. And again, that's not to say that that's what you're doing. I'm just saying that it's, and it's part of the reason why people see different things when they watch film. Like it's part of the reason why like my film evaluation is going to be different than uh, somebody else's is because, we're we may not be watching the same way we may not may not be watching for the same things we may not be watching the same games and so there's a there's a kind of a a gap there in the ability to be objective especially because it's a really subjective thing to watch and be like oh yeah he's good so back back to my statistical rent as well, uh, uh, Tulua Tungavailoa, almost identical stats to both those two, the Mordecai guy and Bo Nix. And they are pretty decent stats. They do, they're pretty decent quarterbacks where they played. Um, Spencer Rattler, not the most exciting quarterback in this draft class, or in most draft classes, but pretty interesting. Looks like he's going to get some draft capital. He's slightly better than all of them, again, across the four or five things that I just looked at looking at the career average. So you have to get slightly better than those guys to be Spencer Rattler, and that shouldn't excite, it, uh, excite most people statistically. Um, and this I think where some people get lost. Like uh, Caleb Williams is like 66% career complete, uh, complete career um, completion percentage, um, whereas all of those guys were like 65s, right? And, and Spencer Rattler is 66. But you look at someone like J.J. M- JJ McCarthy, and he's at 68 See, no. Caleb Williams isn't the best, but that should tell you why just looking at numbers and who's higher, who's greener, who's like it's not doing oh, the Peter, job. Peter, Again, if you put it in context of where he was playing and also consider that he was 4% above the average according to SIPO, which is Josh Hernsmeyer's metric, you adjust it for the depth of throw. It's not perfect, but it's a, it's a reasonable adjustment that actually works instead of just adjusting things to adjust things to make the players you like look good. He's doing a lot better based on the depth of throw that he's actually putting out, and he's doing it at a higher level relative to college players. I'm, I'm told I don't actually know what college conferences, but they're drafted more often from that <laughs> conference, so it counts. Um, but yeah, and he's like leagues above when you compare all four, even though some of those numbers sound similar, which is how we can get lost in the weed, not just with number go green, but the idea of finding a player you like, EJD, and then saying, and then if someone tries to bolster that with a statistics argument, like Zach was saying, it depends how you watch what you're seeing. And I don't always think they're puzzle pieces to put together. It's nice when they line up, but if they're incongruous, um, run with that. And I would say his statistics are incongruous to what you're saying. If you're saying that his accuracy is interesting enough that you think he could be above average quarterback in the NFL, I don't think it's statistical profile, so is that, but I mean, statistics is only one thing. Um, so I'm not waving you off. I'm just saying don't let someone bolster your confidence in your tape evaluation with some of the statistics because the statistics look, eh, and that's general, that face, eh, or that shrug emoji maybe is genuinely what a college profile looks like without adjusting it to adjust it for the sake of making the player I like adjusted to be good. Adjust it. <laughs> Dynasty Coach A, why are you taking the a lot of time we previously agreed upon to make your pick? That's it. That's it. Pick faster. Know, right? You're on the right. clock. I actually, oh. uh, I actually appreciate that comment because the entire time I'm waiting to pick, that's what I'm thinking. But I'm also reasonable enough not to be saying it because I know that's just stupid. But in my head, I allow myself to rant, right? It's like waiting for someone in a queue. They're allowed to wait there and take all the appropriate time they want. But it doesn't mean I don't get the catharsis of ranting about it in my head. That's <laughs> that's the line I draw. James, any credence to my working theory that QBs are overvalued a bit? In, a little bit. Uh, hey, also, hey, hey, hey. Actually... Yes. Yes, there is oh. credence. I would say what's what people's expectations are is typically where you'll find a lot of the misses. Like right now, 
Trevor Lawrence being described as a disappointment. <laughs> he might he might not be Patrick Mahomes or J Justin Herbert. He might just be what we've seen. But that was a solid hit from a rook early rookie pick in the Superflex draft. I think our expectations sometimes, and that's why I spend so much time focusing on it, are way too, well, they're stupid, frankly, because we, we want the moon with every pick. And like Zach's saying, if you have eight that might be the might be something nice, that doesn't mean you've definitely got a moon pick in there just to mix some metaphors around for the fun of it. I, I think that's a, a lot of what's going on. Like people, ex Joe Mixon, uh, Joe Mixon is a multiple top 12 hit in the NFL. He's been a very good running back for fantasy and in the NFL, whether I like him as a person or would if I met him or not is regardless of that. But that's what a great top 12 hit looks like. It's just not It's not set what Saquon Barkley has done for us for a year or Christian McCaffrey has done for a career. Like, you come to appreciate how rare those great things are, which is why we say things like, you know, if you can trade for Justin Jefferson and, C, uh, and Jamar Chase, you just do that. Don't care how old CMC is. You just kind of pay that price if you can win. Like, that's where that comes from because – once you reason uh, appreciate what a reasonable expectation is for a great hit, then you understand how far above that some players end up hitting and just not wanting to move off of that just because value sometimes or a lot or ever. Yeah. I think that's what's going on. But Zach, you have better, more. No, 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 not better. But but yes, better. James, I I think that that quarterback and especially like the the middle tier of quarterback or the lower tier of quarterback so like there there are some difference makers there are some quarterbacks who scored uh, quite a few points per game and if you're if you're anywhere over you know 19 or 20 points per game as a quarterback that's a that's a difference making quarterback that's a that's a Josh Allen that's a Jalen Hurts that you know that's the top tier of of quarterback but once you start getting into that middle tier and that lower tier, like they're still being drafted highly in super flex leagues because everyone thinks they have to have two quarterbacks and they have to, you can play it a little bit like running back where if you have, you know, if, if people are drafting quarterbacks highly, you can, you can pivot and, and draft other positions and either super flex in another position because you can do that in a super flex league or you can, scatter shot kind of the way we approach tight end or the way we approach running back a lot bench spots to quarterbacks who are in situations where either they're the starter but they're not great and and they're like the the last few quarterbacks taken or you take the the viable backups who can play if a starter is injured and all of a sudden you're not paying the premium for that but if you get uh starts out of them you now have a premium position with quasi premium points. The way I approach it in in superflex leagues, and most of my superflex leagues have a tight end premium. Maybe yours don't, but you can figure out what position has the advantage in tight end premium leagues. And I play in a bunch of leagues with with Dynasty Outhouse as the commissioner, and he plays with a one point seven five tight end premium. I don't draft a second quarterback uh, until everybody else is gone and everybody has started taking the wide receivers that don't matter. Uh, mm -hmm. What, what I'll do is I'll draft one oh. solid starter. Yeah. And then I'll start drafting the tight ends and I'll try to get Kelsey and I'll try to get Andrews and I'll try to get Kittle and I'll try to get Pitts and I'll try to like whatever I can get because every one of those tight ends in a 1.75 premium is scoring at or more than what those bottom tier quarterbacks you know the guys that are giving you 15 points or you know or, or whatever a week that don't actually matter i don't care where my points come from i don't care the position that my points come from i care that i have points and especially in the flex positions and super flex positions you don't care what position is scoring you just care that they're scoring in one quarterback league i think quarterbacks are under the top tier quarterbacks are undervalued because I think that's a place that you can get a positional advantage. Late, so not, not in the startup draft because in the startup draft, you want a late round quarter. You want to do the, the JJ Zacharyson because there's a, an acquisition cost. 
But once your league is in swing, you can acquire the top tier quarterbacks in a one quarterback league for less than you can in other leagues because people think, oh, it's one quarterback. It doesn't matter. I can scatter shot and I can figure out quarterback. But you get a positional advantage at a position where there's only one starting per team. So that like that's a that's a positional advantage that I want to go get. So so yes, they're overvalued, especially in Superflex, especially that mid-lower tier. But by the same token, I think the upper tier is undervalued in one quarterback. So it's a bit as always, there's more than more than just the here's a straight answer. There's a lot, there's a lot more that goes on. Now I get to move on my favorite thing where I both annoy and agree with John Hogue at the same time because I like to go, I like to tell you the other part of the thing that he doesn't say while agreeing with the thing that he does say. I don't think they're overvalued. I think they're undervalued in Superflex in general. And from the points perspective, I understand what you're saying. And everything Zach just said is spot on the money. But, and the other part I would throw out and something I know John Bosch with or used to when he spoke to me um, whenever I could, I don't think their value is real. Like, Trying to trade Jared Goff for his value over the last few years has been rough if you need to trade Jared Goff for his value because his points mean nothing to you. Waiting for that mid-tier first, even. It was pretty tough to find the team in the place in the situation where they were willing to give it to you and actually had a first like that. Um, I think that value can be fictional sometimes. At the same time, from a points perspective, which is more the perspective you're talking about, one thing you've got to factor in here, because I think a lot of us have more experience in more commonly think through redraft is all these guys are rostered to the point like last year, God and Minshew had viability. He was not on the waiver wire in dynasty. It certainly wasn't in any half decent league in the super flex league. Well, there's more turnover at the quarterback position on a yearly basis than we typically like to acknowledge one. Those guys normally don't start again. I mean, Sam Howells, if you drafted had a great season did more for that team than most QBs have done since Robert Griffin III and is gone. <laughs> and let alone the Gardner Minshews of the world who just never get the second year and kick around the league as a well above average backup, occasionally getting an eight game stretch. Geno Smith was that for a while, by the way, and so was Tyro Taylor. So these guys normally don't get a permanent home or a long term job as that replacement quarterback, even if they do pretty well. So there is turnover and all that stuff uh, can be added on to the points that you've just made about them being overvalued. But here's the thing. There's also a limited supply and demand in the dynasty aspect of them. Everyone's rostered. Even the deep guys are rostered. They're hard to trade for value. So you, you, you're you offering trades for them that aren't good enough and normally they don't get done unless you're willing to feel like you overpay to get a Jared Goff, which is never fun or exciting. Um, so... And there's only 32 of them any given week. In fact, less because of bye weeks. Now, again, to go back onto the thing that John Ho won't like me for, plenty of those guys are scoring you six and seven points. They don't have a decent floor of 15 points because they're a quarterback. So like Zach was saying, you can play tight ends and wide receivers pretty comfortably to replace a mid-tier quarterback. That's true, too. But they're more consistently being able to give you, uh, they more consistently give you 20 points in the weeks where they're not giving you six and sevens. Whereas, uh, you know, even the types of wide receivers you replace them with can't do that. Now, the top tier tight ends can, which is why Zach's pointing them out as potential replacements. But there's relatively few of those tight ends to add to the list of quarterbacks. So there's still a supply and demand issue for that super plate spot. Because all those wide receivers that score like that are going in your wide receiver or flex spots, not your super flex spots. If you have a team that deep, you this isn't an issue for you. You could play a penguin at your super flex spot and win. If you're able to plug Justin Jefferson into your QB super flex spot, because that's how deep your wide receivers or running backs or tight ends are. Um, and so I think it's a little pie in the sky to say they're infinitely replaceable. They're a little bit more replaceable, like Zach was saying, those mid-tier guys, but not infinitely. Like, you can't add 10 wide receivers. You can maybe add a couple wide receivers and then those top-tier tight ends um, that offer you that value. And by a couple wide receivers, I mean the Gabe Davises of the world, by the way, that can really give you that hit-and-miss swing that is really valuable 
um, if you have to add them into a, a super flex or a, a flex type spot in general. So there's not too many you can actually add to that. So while they are overvalued, because you can't get that trade value, and they do only score six and seven points most weeks, not 15 and 20. John's idea, by the way, is you should be more willing to stream quarterback. And I pushed him on this once, because what he's saying I don't think comes through the way he explains QBX. He means you should bench Patrick Mahomes for Jared Goff in a good week. He thinks he can, he thinks he can um, roster flip quarterbacks that accurately that he can get better QB points by sitting Josh Allen or Patrick Mahomes or Jalen Hurts in the weeks that Jared Goff outscores them. And I just don't have that confidence in the entire industry, let alone my own start-sit decisions. That's where he gets the numbers that prove quarterback has the level of strength he suggests it does. And, and we disagree and argue about it. But uh, he's wonderful and you should listen to him. But still, um, I hate him. So there we go. Um yeah, so yes, they're overvalued, but they're also undervalued, and there's a significant supply and demand issue in Dynasty, despite the alternative methods Zach's describing, which are solid strategies to try and deal with it. It still only expands it just a little bit. So they're both undervalued and overvalued at the same time. The way I've approached it is you hit that top tier harder than everyone else. You fade the middle tier for strategies like Zach's talking about. Tight ends just should be going in that range, and they don't, for example. And, and rookies as well. You can be a little, if you want, willing to invest a little bit more risk in that area of the draft. And then you come back into that. I'm describing it as the second tier of quarterback because my tiers aren't everyone's. That might not be true. But those, you know, QBs 15 to 18, the Andy Daltons, the Kirk Cousins of the world, the Jared Goss of the world that people don't like, but are really good. And occasionally you catch a Dak Prescott in there and it's wonderful. Um, or even a Russell Wilson right now. And just have more of those than you should. That's the way I would end up having as many quarterbacks as would make John Hogue happy only when a draft lands like that for me. Um, so, yeah, it's multi-featured. And you're not thinking in the wrong direction, I would say. And I think it's what Zach was pointing out. It, it really depends on how your league plays it and how your draft goes, how you can try and take advantage of the fact that sometimes they are overvalued, but also they're kind of undervalued at the same time which makes it very league and draft dependent how you can try and approach one aspect of the quarterback position or the other. But again, I want to point out they're not that much more replaceable than you would necessarily think. But there are a little, there's an edge there. He has a, um, and others are definitely not wrong suggesting it. Anyway, I'm in a ranty mood tonight. There you go. Uh, it feels like it's easy to scrap for a passable QB during a year than for a passable wide receiver, for example. Scrap four a pass. Yeah, no, but he's he's just saying that that it's easier to replace a quarterback with a because of the again it's the elevator escalator like it's easier to say this quarterback is going to be a starting quarterback because for all intents and purposes you know who is going to be the starting yeah. quarterback and that is one thing that John likes to point out you should value QBs and how certainty they are starters I actually like that way of thinking about it um but not. Yeah, a little bit, I guess. We can know who the QBs are next year a little more certainly than we can the wide receivers. I would say that's solid. But that's also part of why they have value, even though they might be hard to trade for that. They have more value in some leagues. Like Corum Dog rating on Flick. Like <laughs> Doberman. Do Doberman level. <laughs> well... What do you think you have all the tight ends? Do I have any advantage rostering four of the top five tight ends? Well, yeah, if it's super flex, to Zach's point, you could use them that way. Take I mean, Bob, it's team. always it, it's always an advantage. You have them if if uh, man, if you can find a way to get them in your uh, lineup, we're feeling good. We are feeling good. I assume three of them are Kyle Pitts, though. <laughs> Franklin's a Mike Evans impersonator. Okay, I yeah, get it. Back, fall after catch. But it was always Franklin. Uh, I think Franklin was a standout player there. I, I like Franklin quite a lot based on my receiver profile, up, where, as I didn't like Knicks. And you might be onto something there. Franklin might be built more by Knicks than then vice versa, and that would create uh, profiles that would have opposite results in my process. I just 
that I, I don't think that's happened very often, but it could. And you're watching films, so you, you, you have an avenue to answer that question that I possibly could, to be clear. Philip J. Fry, 1QB, 12 team start, 8, no tight end premium, and he's a competing team. Uh, give James Cook and a 25 first and other teams, which is actually relevant, and receive CMC. Thoughts? Yes. Yeah, yeah. If you feel pretty confident that that team's competitive, I don't mind paying that for CMC. Yeah, especially it's, with a start yeah. eight. I mean, you're. I you're wish looking, it was your pick, but yeah. It's, yeah, <laughs> you're 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 looking for you're looking for hammers. It's. I mean, it's it's probably. I mean, that's the the iron price to go get CMC though. Like Cook was pretty I good. I would say. Yeah. yeah, it feels bored. It feels like it's iron pricey. But not for me, if that makes sense. Like I'm very comfortable there, but I would hope to find better because some everyone else seems a little higher on cooks, a little low on CMC. But uh, it, it, hit, it hits my sweet spot, put it that way. Zach with the JJ hoodie answering questions. Damn right, well played, <laughs> very efficient. Yeah, I am not bad. That's why we have. Well, many reasons we have Zach. Zach, could you get a film take on Jalen McMillan? I've heard this one. And, I, and Jermaine Burton. I can give you the Jalen McMillan. I can't give you a Burton yet because I have not completed my uh, Burton evaluation. McMillan, uh, 6'1", 192, wide receiver at Washington. Really, really smooth route runner, but I don't think he has a lot of suddenness, which is a little bit backwards from if you if you look at statistically what he uh, accomplished, you kind of expected him to be one of those quick separator slot guys. He's not necessarily that. He does a really good job, though, against zone coverage. He finds open spaces, works into throwing lanes, does a really good job setting up his quarterback for success that way. He will against man-to-man, -man, and he has to because he, he's not the quick twitch. He does a really good job setting up defenders, so he, he slow plays, and then he'll hit them with a double move, so he gets them to bite on the first one and then takes off over the top. And he's very consistent with hands catching, catching the ball out away from his body. When we talk hands catching, that's what I mean, because we're we're catching the ball out away from the body where if the ball travels in, you get a chance for the ball to kind of hit off him, creating a drop, or the defender has a, a much better chance uh, to get hands in and break up a pass. So if your hands catching, you kind of body between the defender and the ball too. I do think he has uh, struggles with man-to-man -man coverage with that creation of separation. He also, he's not sudden in route, but also not sudden with the ball. And again, this is a, a player that Washington used a ton in the screen game and on short, you know, like slants and things. So you're expecting him to add a lot of, yards after the catch on those type of plays and I, I don't think I saw that as much as I was anticipating and he's another receiver who is really bothered by physical man coverage so like I like Jalen McMillan but I think he's a secondary weapon on a team where he needs to work inside and over the middle in the like in zone coverages cover cover two and the, the that sort of thing where um he can find those open spots but i i really don't see him as being he's not one of the players that i look at and say oh he's going to be a one from a wide receiver two he's a wide receiver two interesting i have him that 14 to 16 range yeah, I mean, I got him. I got him, and, and, and I actually think our roles matched up there a little bit, which is unusual. So that's cool. But <laughs> Dave didn't ask me either. <laughs> no, I like. Him. And I will. I will eventually, Dave. Uh, Burton's on my list of players that I <laughs> I need to watch. But I just again, I'm I'm hand like like line fishing. I'm I'm one one player at a time, and I'm watching eight to fourteen games of these players so it's it a little bit time consuming 
I uh, made some. Oh no, I did not like buttons. <laughs> uh, I made a JJ Sega Whiteside reference. So. Oh, turn around. Yeah. <laughs> Low A dot, high slot, shades of JJ Sega Whiteside and his overall profile, basically, is what I'm referring to there. Uh, with a lower target share. Uh, those are my notes. I, I put him last overall. I, yeah, didn't like him too much. Anthony Carson, do we have any faith in Hollywood? Yes. To the moon. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I honestly do. Yeah, I think he's very effective for what he does in the NFL. Last year was a little disappointing. And I'm trying to come to terms with the... I read a Spaceman tweet talking about how that was uh, that highlighted the weaknesses in Kyler Murray's game, which is not a position I was expecting to be in my life. Um, but I do know that quarterback's my weakest evaluation, so maybe he's got a point on that, But especially because it helps bolster the Hollywood case, frankly. Um, he's a piece of an offense, not, not, not an offense, um, just as a player, Hollywood, that is. But he's really effective. Um, and he's going to the offense that, you know, just plug a good wide receiver in, man. I always feel a little nervous about those kind of arguments. And Rashi Rice was fantastic at it last year. He's younger and he just did it. But the team also got Hollywood, which doesn't make me think they're entirely against the idea. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I, if I had to vote, I'd say Hollywood comes out on top because I have a longer history and more faith in the player. Uh, than just a one-year rookie profile. But there's no denying it could easily be Bryce, who's a winner. The, the real answer in Kansas, and we all just need to deal with that, is, is Kelsey. Like, could we finally just just know that? Like, <laughs> that's good players around him. Kelsey's, Kelsey's the receiver that you want on that team. Um, I definitely think... And I'm not even going to say at value, because I kind of hate those arguments. If I had to have one at the same value, and it was fair, I'll take Hollywood. In Dynasty, the age is always going to win, though, so I am going to actually get a value plus, but still. I, now, I you don't... Also, now, you you like both players, and you actually evaluate who how they play, so I'm interested if you have a separator there. So I, I think probably, and this is, again, the way the way I see that, team breaking down the way I see the players playing. Right. I, I, it will be, I will be shocked if Rashi Rice does not draw more targets than. Um, um, I think that, I think that they've been looking for a field stretcher for, well, since Tyree Hill left and, <laughs> and, and, that and, makes and sense. <laughs> yeah, well, and, and, Hollywood Brown can do like that is one of his traits that he is very good. Like he's very good at being very fast and going down the field. And that's not to say that he won't be successful that way because I, I think he will be. He's he's a better player than Nicole Hardman and oh. the the other, yeah, the other guys that they've had kind of filling that role. So he's an upgrade. It's probably better for that entire offense. But I still like I still would I, I don't mind getting a first for him, getting out, getting a first. The yeah, third that's... doesn't really matter. Uh no. I, I don't think that you sold high on him, but I, I also don't fair. think that you yeah, I don't think you got taken. I think that that's a that's a good like kick the can the... down the road, get a 25 pick and and 25 the 25 class. If you have an extra pick in that class, you have mobility to move up. If you want to, there's also this. The next class has a, a a bunch of running backs, and so that may be a, a pivot where you you get out of Hollywood Brown, you get a running back for next year. So you're you're moving kind of your team. No, forward. I was asked something like this before. Is it time to sell high on Hollywood? And I'm going to borrow a phrase that we we say a lot here no it's time to sell fair on hollywood it, yeah. it's not that he's more expensive is that you can actually get a reasonable value for him right now like we normally talk about that coming the other direction it's not that they're sold low but you can actually trade for them at their value and uh, this is the opposite direction of that like i'm pretty happy to have hollywood and i have a competitive team but there's also no down 
no real downside to getting out at fair value on a competitive team when you're trying to build that part of your roster as well. Yeah. But if you have Hollywood, you can have more hopes. Uh, here in Zach's pick, you know, narratives and narratives, and just to counteract my own there, he could be more of a Kadarius Tony replacement, infinitely better than Kadarius Tony for fantasy and for the Chiefs, um, and have nothing to do with Rashi Rice. If you think about it in terms of a replacement argument, which you shouldn't because targets aren't replaced that way. But they definitely got a better weapon uh, for them than um, uh, Kadarius Tony. Now he's gone. Yeah, I mean, no reason was... to think this really has an effect on Rashi Rice after last year. That would be a very reasonable point. Pick, of view. Kadarius Tony and Sky Moore and just Nicole kick him all to the curb like, and have yeah, Hollywood. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> Yep. Yeah, and, every and other, target other... that goes to Hollywood instead of any of those other guys is better, and Rashi Rice is just exactly the, where he wants. The other piece on this, and it doesn't matter at this point, Andrew, because you already you already made this trade, but <laughs> this could be a micro market where if you have Hollywood Brown, like, yes, right now there is a little bit of buzz on him, but if he has two games where he's like, four catches for 95 yards and a touchdown, all of a sudden he's Mahomes' guy and there's a bigger sell market there uh, for for more than a late 25 first. But again, like I don't mind getting out of Hollywood for the first, but there's also potential for there to be some meat on the bone with a Mahomes off. And we've seen it before. How many times have we run out? Uh, oh, Chiefs. And we, they, we did it with Sky Moore. And, they, and to be clear, did it with, yeah. that's a bad – like, that's why I don't like absolutely. it. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. But, but yeah. you can use that to your advantage knowing that's a bad argument. And I, the only reason I'm dithering and I want to say, always trade side the Hollywood side is because Hollywood's one of those players for me. He's always underrated, perpetually undervalued. Like, I really liked him in Dynasty. Him and Lockett uh, are a pair for a few, for a few years now. Um, I would say Smith, but he proved it early enough that everyone backed off. <laughs> so I, I don't think he really fits on the list anymore. But I've had so much luck at Marcus Brown over the years. It's ridiculous. And they've always been helpful for me. Um, but to be clear, again, Andrew, this is a very good trade, solid trade. There might be a window in the future. That's, that's making a good point there where you're like, damn it, if I sold him now, I could get two first. But you're yeah. also bat on a competitive, especially since you seem to be talking if you're if you're a competitive roster, you got to weigh that against the certainty of definitely improving your value side. That pick is infinitely more tradable to more teams for a longer period of time than a player. There's less peaks and troughs during a season. And again, you could hit some peaks for Hollywood, and I really think you could. Um, but there's no reasonable reason to expect that. And so it's a very good trade right now can, uh, on most teams in most situations. So, yeah, yeah, outside of my Hollywood look, I think that's fair. Alan David, sorry I was late. Yeah, damn it, Alan. Imagine being late to the dance. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so Just a bit that time <laughs> Try the corner. My... Missed it. There you go. It's good. Uh, Squirrels, uh, who do you all like for the wide receiver four right now? I have uh, Brian Thomas, I think. Yep. I have it Wait, right Peter, here. I Peter, I, re- like, I still am. Yeah, Tom. I'm very I'm cons- annoyed by it still. I'm very <laughs> concerned that that we are close in our rankings. So this is part of my personal sickness with Dynasty and why I haven't just I don't just play by myself at this point. I am deeply concerned and really excited about the amount of Undunze just pure desire on my timeline. Every time <laughs> I log on, there's someone talking about how he is basically the next second coming of football jesus <laughs> i'm like i'm very concerned so many good players with so many good processes like him that much more than xavier worthy or brian thomas and yet at the same time i'm very excited about it like that's that's my personal sickness because i don't say a, i can't understate this solid same tier didn't do a thing wrong it's what a good player should do in a situation i think he did really well i prefer worthy and thomas pretty 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 confidently at the same value and draft notwithstanding i don't see a player that separates from either of them let alone separates that much and that's like i assume scribbles if you're saying who do you like at wide receiver four you're assuming that it's odunze at three it's not 
It's not. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, my ranks are out there. Just shout at me there. But no, yeah, yeah. And our ranks are the same. If you just look at Zach's ranks and you got my ranks, I kind of so weird. The first seven, point. the first seven are this. I'm like, what is going on? That's pretty. I mean, we've had similarities before. I don't know. We've gone seven deep. No, and it was seven deep without even talk. Like I hadn't listened to anything you'd done. I hadn't looked at any of your work. I, I before didn't... the hooting any. Yeah, yeah, and, and so, you, yeah, you hadn't listened to anything, and we we just happened to like share rankings in the DM, and we were like, Spider Man, Jif. Don't don't talk to one guy every week if you yeah. don't want that. That like that's yeah. poison. <laughs> like you're basically just playing the same. I'm telling you, it's like the it's like the old married married couples that start to look like each other <laughs> after a while. That's where we're at. There you go. I'm starting to get uh, your hair. I, it's bad. I was going to say, I can't wait to lose my hair. I was tired of it. Uh, James, I uh, meant to say easier, maybe, uh, to find a Flacco Brissette type with y WWE during the year with Y Brissette. I, I don't like Flacco will be rostered in most of my leagues by the time the season starts because he's a borderline starter. Brissette, too, because he's had startability. My Superflex leagues, those are tough finds on the waiver wire. On the old wave of wire, but that kind of goes to know your league. I, I, I I'm aware and have played in a few more casual leagues, and I could see how those guys are more pick upable still, even in dynasty. But I think my my standard answers are going to come from a place where they shouldn't be. Like fairly active players should have those types of quarterbacks and superflex mostly locked up, even in shallower leagues. But maybe so know your league. Um, like again, last year Gardner Minshew wasn't sitting on the waiver wire when he was finally usable. Neither was yeah. um, most, not most, because there were a lot last year. But uh, like the first decent chunk of backup starters that got in or, or rostered, there was no. I looked, but there was no one even looking to start with. It wasn't until you started to get to the third or fourth string guys. Well, like, it's maybe a chance. And, and that's, I mean, that's kind of why in superflex leagues you would play quarterback similar to running back where you're rostering those yeah. backups you know if you've got a if you've got a deeper bench you can you can roster multiple backup quarterbacks multiple backup running backs because you know that when they're starting they're getting volume i mean quarterbacks obviously get they're they're going to throw the ball they're going to the way i would do that is to go back to Zach's point play your quarterback too loose to the point of not having one, and you be the one to take advantage. If they're not getting rostered in your league, there is almost, and this is a painful truth, I've had to come to terms with my dynasty leagues over the years, there's always a wide receiver you can drop. There's <laughs> yeah. always a wide receiver you can drop for a tight end or a quarterback in the leagues where that makes sense. Thoughts? Yeah, roster I like cloggers. rostering my deeper wide receivers, and they, they're they just mostly, yeah. They won't go first. Man, Caleb is set up real well to succeed. He really is. Especially, yeah. I am, uh, the, I'm more convinced. It's like people hating on good prospects at this time of year m convinces me more. Oh, yeah, that's definitely the guy. <laughs> like, this is where they overthink and start looking for weird-ass reasons. Uh, yeah, J Jamar Chase during his rookie season had a whole turmoil of he didn't have hands in, in his build-up to his rookie before He couldn't catch the ball. So there was like this little buy window on the Jamar Chase pick, if you could get it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and like almost every time there's such a, a clear tier one profile, even if they don't hit, that yeah. we almost always talk ourselves out of it, or well, some portion of us do. Kansas City can't be done a receiver, right? I mean, it's not doesn't have to be, but I don't see a great reason. Yeah, that they I mean, can yeah. go add like again. You're thinking it needs a great wide receiver. It's got two pretty decent ones, which is more than it's had in forever. Kelsey is their receiver. Like, yeah, they're very good at just having Kelsey. Like, it's not the team isn't missing something, is what I'm saying. If if they can get Marvin Harrison Jr., they should definitely do that. But or, or Malik Nebers, but like they have no desperate need to add a better wide receiver. They have two better. This is the best two wide receivers they've had since. Ty Tyreek Hill made up more than them. Like, that's it. Uh, have you all struggled uh, to down tier? Or on orphan where trying... Yeah, it's always kind of difficult to trade for value when you know you're just doing that. I'm doing that DF DLF league, and it sucked. Sucked. Ah. 
big donkey paws. Uh, and often we're trying to split Amamara into two pieces. Establish wide receiver and a pick or rejections. Is it normal? Should I hold into season? You should hold until you get a good trade or you don't. Um, but you should, can expand the types of trades you're looking for for value because you're just thinking value, not I need a wide receiver, I need a pick. That's a very solid way of going about it, but most people, like, they understand that trade. Whereas if you trade for Stroud, not or not Stroud, Stroud the Superflakes maybe, or if you trade for the tight end position, sometimes you don't catch people sleeping. You just catch fair value for a thing they're not one-to-wanting. With that, they see you getting two great things because their wide receiver is obviously great. They're on their roster, and there's an extra bump there. And instead of seeing themselves getting an improvement, they see what you're getting, if you know what I mean. Whereas if you go slightly off the beaten path for a fair value trade, like go to tight end, go to quarterback, sometimes you can find better trades. I I've honestly find my best pass, and I'm not a strong trader, to be clear, but I've tried to do better, is going through leagues, looking at rosters, and looking for an understanding of their roster. Now, what I think might be different than what they think, and you just have to be like, oh, oh sorry, I misunderstood but go looking for teams that are infinitely competitive right now and you're building. So you're like, here's points, give me value. Or you have a strong weakness here at this wide receiver one spot because that's what you're giving. Give me your whatever that they have that's extra shiny on, on their roster. But go looking at your the rosters in your league and try to see where there might be a puzzle piece fit, if that makes sense. Like that's the best luck I've had. Try not to explain the trade when you send it. It should make sense to them. If it doesn't, then they think differently about their team. That's fine as well. But honestly, I, I find better trade offers going through my leagues and thinking about their rosters that way. But again, Dynasty Outhouse, uh, he live streams on every DLF show, uh, which is why he won't come on ours anymore. He has. <laughs> um, but you can ask him anytime. He's always going to have better ideas for trades, which is why I enjoy when he shows up. Not his personality or anything. He's not a very nice guy. He's quite mean. But he's good at trades. <laughs> Zach, do you have any better? You you are a little more creative for the trades as well. Well, I, I again, I think that right now is a tough time to sell already established players, especially receivers oh. in this with this class, because everyone is talking about what great receivers are, are in this class. So, like, getting a top four, five or six pick with um for Amon Ross St. Brown plus an established player is a tall ask right now because everyone thinks that Odunze is going to be Amon Ross St. Brown or Brian Thomas is going to be Amon Ross St. Brown or neighbors is going to be Amon Ross St. Brown. So it's a, it's you a trick right with your picks. Yeah. That be your first bet. You should yeah. be more interested in 25 anyway, because you're more building. Yeah. building. And, and, and if you've already tried the Waddle picket uh, Smith, Type a little undervalued wide receivers, you're probably not going to hit on them. That's the other thing I was going to say. Zach, carry on. No, it, and it's it's your you don't even necessarily have to trade Wilson. Amon Ross St. Brown to be uh rebuilding. Like Amon Ross no. St. Brown can if be you a can't get a good rebuild, trade. Uh, yeah, to be to rebuild around. So like if you're not getting value back from Amon Ross St. Brown, that's fine. You have a good player. Uh, but the other the other piece to that is if you start looking at other wide receivers who may be in a tier down but are a similar potentially similar producer, like that's that's kind of a way to attack that or instead of trying to get a wide receiver back, you can get another position. Like you, you don't have to go get a wide receiver back for I'm going to say Brown. You can get a tight end. I mean, you can go get one of those young tight ends for I'm going to St. Brown and, and get like, you know, tight end plus you could get pits plus, or you could, or you could, um, you know, kind of navigate it that way way so there are a bunch of different ways to do this but the the big full stop like don't do this is don't take less than Amon Ross St. Brown in value if you're trying to rebuild because he's obviously one of your most valuable pieces he's a top five wide receiver so like you don't have to trade him and he's probably worth more when he's scoring 23 points a game in season than he is 
right now where he's set against the backdrop of Oh, it's a generational wide receiver class, which it isn't. It's a it's a really good wide receiver class. It's good. Um, I, I don't know. I'm probably overthinking a bit. I was thinking, keep an eye on the Brock Bowers pick. I don't think yeah. he's going to go top four in every draft because he's a tight end. We just Kyle Pitts. Come on. So mm -hmm. he'll fall to five or no one's taken him at five. And you can start thinking, Brock Bowers plus what? Because he's a top tier player who, once he gets to five, you're already looking at a bit of a value there, I think. And um, so, could I get this pick off this guy in draft for Amon Ra plus a 25 first, which I'm more interested in anyway, because I'm not as competitive this year and tight ends have a long aura. They might not be thinking about drafting Brock Bowers is a thing. So, you kind of have to gauge it. Is he going to fall to six? I would do it at six. If it's a Block Bowers pick, I'm on Ra for a, plus another first. It's a little in the celly, but it fits your goals, if you know what I mean. And I think he might be a player who could end up sliding a little bit, depending on your league, obviously. I'm not, I'm not profit here. I'm a little bit of profit. Not really. Um, but a little bit. Not really. Um, <laughs> that joke's really funny. Um, that, that's, that's a thought I have while Zach was talking about uh, Sam Laporta types, young tight ends. I was like, what if Brock Bowers isn't quite there yet because he is a rookie in Kyle Pitts. Like anyway. I wouldn't Kyle Pitts it. I would try and block Bowers it. Uh Todd Radmaker. Uh defense have been playing a shell three against Kansas City to prevent deep passes. Um it makes sense because it's also part of their game. They want to distract but you with those so they can free up their main receiver. But having Brown and Rice might be another part of that. They now have two really good options to do that with which stresses that part of the defense a little more and um, which perhaps brings that back into line for them maybe that's where they're going um, counterpoint. I, I, de I definitely hmm. yeah like yes they have but also counterpoint they have had really poor like deep threat wide receivers so that's, it's a it's a, it a kind of a combo where like they're still yes they're still playing that that shell three defense they're still playing the the preventing deep throws but they're playing that because kansas city had been able to attack with deep throws i don't think they, yeah, they can. i don't think they can at this point like i, I mean they they probably will yeah yeah i think it'll be easier but yeah well yeah it's not gonna be as good. yeah yeah same page same page uh participating in mocks i'm really struggling with which wide receiver rookie i should like after the top five yeah that's always a tricky area where you feel like you're overspending on that high variance area of wide receivers you know not to take wide receivers that deep usually but this is a class where you kind of have to suck it and suck it up and just throw your dart i think wide receivers deep into the first round makes sense this year yeah. after bowels is gone I and uh, who do you like six to ten? Um, I, I can show you or literally just read my ranks. Uh, let's see, it's uh, Harrison, Neighbors, Worthy, Thomas. That's four. Adunze, uh, as Worthy to Adunze is just one tier. Um, Harrison and Neighbors are in the same tier one. Then I have Tez, who I, how I think he prefers to be referred to. Tez Walker, Troy Franklin at seven, uh, Jamari Thrash who I think I'm slightly unusual liking there because Lad McConkie is probably a better, safer pick for sure. Actually a safer pick than the two I mentioned before, but I like the upside of the three that I mentioned before Walker, Franklin and Thrash. And that's nine. Then Ricky Pearsall. Pearsall. I, I've seen him getting some hype recently, but he's, but he's a solid prospect. Slightly lower tier conference. If I remember right, uh, Competent NFL player, but he looks like he could be a confident, competent NFL player to me, too. And that's seven to ten. Franklin Thrash, McConkey, Pearsall. Yeah. And I, I'm, I don't feel I'm, like great first round picks, but it's where I'm at and wide receiver makes sense this time of year. But again, draft is going to shake that up a little bit, especially that range. But that's where I'm at. Yeah. I, I have a little bit different, but very similar, Peter, where I'm it's Tez Walker, Pearsall, McConkey. Franklin, Malachi Corley. I, I don't even mind throwing like a Xavier Leggett Malachi dart in one. there. He's... But like that's yeah. that's that group of the next five or six wide receivers for me, Dave, is is Walker, Pearsall, Lad McConkey, Franklin, 
Corley. And then Xavier Leggett had like one season of just uber production. He's really athletic, really good uh, with the ball in his hands. It's hard to see a guy with one year of production and be really excited. But, you know, if you're mm. if you're taking him in the beginning of the second round of the of your rookie draft or, or mid second round, like I don't mind throwing a dart at that guy because we're throwing darts at that point. You're throwing darts anyway. So it's a kind of range where if your favorite running back has actually fallen to the running yeah. back two spot, yeah, you can take that guy too. But yeah, I, I think McConkey is going to be very popular there, who I don't mind there at all. The other two are the other three, like say, are upside players, higher variance. So in terms of the outcome, and Pearsall seems solid, he seems really solid in the same vein yeah. as McConkey. Like as long as you get some draft capital, uh, same with McConkey actually. They'll probably fall into that range pretty comfortably, and it, you, you're getting a good player. What the fantasy outcome of it's going to be, I think, is somewhat muted. But there's a pretty reasonable range of, of outcomes of having some fantasy relevance, like Josh Downs last year, kind of a thing. Yeah. I like Josh Downs' profile a lot more, to be clear. I thought there was more upside, so far there wasn't. But um, that might be like the type of rookie season you could expect in the best case. Yeah. Uh, I have cowing them McCauley after that group, by the way. Like, I, I, I like both pretty well. Yep. Um, but, yeah, it's, there's a falling did expectation you, of draft capital at some point. I'm like, Where did you fall on Malik Washington? Because I've been hearing a lot about him. Like, yeah, he was uber, uber productive this past season. Uh, yeah, I think we talked about him last week. Someone asked, and I did a. I haven't oh. made notes on him yet, but I know I looked at him and I ran through him last week. I, essentially, what I said is I understood. I liked him when I just looked. He came onto my top ten list of players I want to go look at, and I was surprised I wasn't seeing him ranked anywhere. But when yeah. I dug into his numbers a little bit, I was like, oh, okay, uh, yeah. The 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 pre draft score was kind of eh. yeah, yeah. Lying, kind of a little bit of a lie. Let, let's see if I can recreate some of what I'm uh, said. That's a wide receiver profiler. That's not going to help me. Those are QBs. So, yeah, might take. Well, um, it was, it, you said you watched his... him a little bit, though. Yeah, well, and he so he he transferred to Virginia, and mm. um, it ended up ended up having a like a, a great 2023 season where he had 110 catches, 1400 yards, nine touchdowns. Like he is, he may be the, I don't want to say the best, but he's one of the best receivers in this class with the ball in his hands. Like once he's got the ball, he is essentially a running back. He's 5'9", 192 pounds. He's got great contact balance. He will break tackles. He does a really good job uh, seeking separation against zones. Which again, since he's primarily a slot player, that is going to be beneficial. He, he's he's going to be inside. He's going to see a lot of uh, plays over the middle, plays where he can either beat zones with uh, slants or hitches or curls or outs, that sort of thing, like the shorter routes. He has very good hands and doesn't often body catch, but it's strange. He's not necessarily sudden at the stem of his route and you expect him to be a, like slot players. You want them to be sudden. You want them to have that burst at the stem of their route where they can put a defender on skates where you're attacking, uh, you know, a foot to gain leverage and then, and then breaking back the other way. And Malik Washington just doesn't really do that very well. I also think he can be bothered by physicality uh, against man coverage which is funny because with the ball he's so great, but but in route he gets kind of bumped off or or shut down, and he doesn't create a lot of space for a slot. A lot of his a lot of his catches were him being in motion or him on a bubble screen, and, and so they're creating a lot of touches for him. Like I think he's I think he's a Interesting player, a good player. I like the yards after catch, but you're going to have to have a little bit of a creative offense in order to get him enough touches, enough catches to be fantasy, like really fantasy relevant. It's a, it's not quite as stark as the Rondell Moore thing 
where like Rondell Moore was used a ton on screens and and pop passes and that sort of thing. But Malik Washington was also used a lot that way. And so you're going to have to have a little bit more creativity from an offensive coordinator for him to be super successful. Um, yeah, I was getting confused with the other Washington fella in this draft. Uh, yeah, that last year was pretty impressive. Was he playing at age 22 for Virginia in the ACC? Yep. Yeah, it, it seems like our senior breakout transfer thing, which is going to become increasingly common, I guess. He had like yeah. 34% of the targets per game. Like he was huge that year. Uh, but again, an 8 dot kind of modifies at three yards per round run and that three receiving yards per team pass attempt, and only happening at age 22 is a little disappointing. Before that, he was very meh, especially as a high slot player. Um, I know what the, the, those expectations are a little elevated because the volume has to be higher the less you're getting under the ball, whereas the efficiency tends to be have higher expectation. Yeah, I, yeah. Um, I think it's just a senior breakout player more than anything, and I... Didn't rank him particularly highly, put it that way. But that last year, I, I can see where the solidness comes from. But those aren't trends I go into a lot anymore. Yeah. I think we became used to it. I'm actually looking for the averages because I can't remember what they were, but I can't remember what tab I put them on, if you can believe it. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. Uh, he's running I don't an know, 80% my... slot with an ADOT um, under 13, right? Yeah, he's a definitely slot player. Like, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they have a lot higher expectations in receiving yards per team pass attempt and yards for route run because they tend to be linked, which means that he's over three on both, which is really high, to be clear. Like, two is good, and over three is, like, insane, especially if you do it between the ages of 18 and 19 and 20. But at 22, a lot of senior players going, even if they transferred, could hit those marks with his slot rate kind of a little less impressive, but it's still pretty good. Had a solid final year, but it's not enough to like move my needle too much. But yeah, solid. I'm Ross St. Brown of the 108 and Brian Robinson of the 210. No one near enough for I'm Ross St. Brown for me. You, you yeah. like Brian Robinson, and a lot of people do. That's putting too much value on his name right now for me. Uh, yeah. I, I don't think he could get there. Yeah. No, I would rather have St. Brown. Like, if you put that pick inside the top five, it's still not enough, but it's actually a better trade-off. You need at least a top five pick to go with Brian Robinson to try and get on the mark, personally. Or give away. Oh, no, I'm concerned with my draft advice, if you all you all agree. Me too. <laughs> Me too, Bob. Dame Overboard, how do you compare the value of Bajon versus Tyreek for teams competing? That's actually an interesting question. You can make some adjustments. For example, uh, I think it's an Adam Hosted rule that play running backs at least 2.3. I think he puts a point in there. But two years younger than wide receivers in the similar scoring range should be considered about the same value. Uh, the, dis the difference in age here is slightly bigger than that. So I think Bajon eats him out. Um, I have ranks as well, which you could look at. I'm pretty sure Bajon is above Tyreek. I'm a little below average on Tyreek Hill. So I want to get ahead of the curve of people going, he's old now, sell. And then everyone's saying, I can't sell. No one will do it all of a sudden. It's like, yeah, because that's happening now. Yeah. Not in a year when everyone tells you everyone else is going to panic. Um, but anyway, um, so yeah, I, I think that's an interesting way of viewing it. Um, in terms of a competing team, running back is always going to be more viable to helping you be a more competitive team than wide receiver. But Bajon Robinson hasn't quite hit his stride in what we hope he can be, which is a CMC level difference maker. Right. But CMC is right there, and you're probably going to get a more interesting trade if you go for CMC. That that that's honestly my first thought. Um, but Tyreek, you need to add to Tyreek to get Bajon Robinson. I'm not sure many Tyreek owners are interested in that because they have Tyreek Hill, and if they're right. at all competitive, that's a pretty good thing. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's it. Like if you if you look at it in the value vacuum, it it's Bijan. If you look yeah. at it in terms of like what production you're getting for the value, it's Tyreek. So like you know, probably it's, Tyreek. But yeah, again, my hope is that 
like the whole value of Bijan Robinson is that he could get up there. Right. If he does that young, he'll be infinitely more valuable yeah. than most things. And, but there's a little risk in there. So it's yeah. also that risk reward thing on that well, side. And, of it. and and here's the 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 thing with Tyreek Hill is like he's currently the wide receiver nine uh on DLF's ADP. Yeah, but it's valuable coming up for him. But yeah, coming off coming off just an absolutely ridiculous season yeah. in terms of fantasy. <laughs> Which he's probably gonna repeat. We should expect him to repeat it. Yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> so th- like those points are awesome, but you can get a reasonable facsimile of, or should be able to get a reasonable facsimile of those points from Bijan while maintaining the value. So, like on most of on most of my teams, I would rather have Bijan. If I am the bull of the woods already, I guess I'll take Tyreek Hill and ride off into the sunset with him. And I have Tyreek's a little bit of an awkward story, but I I've done that with so many wide men. like I I've, I've gone over the cliff like Thelma and Louise style with Calvin Johnson and Antonio Brown and boy was that a rough cliff and like at some point you just go over the cliff with those guys because again if you have reasonable good expectations those guys that sit above it as uh, they're very rare we think every player is going to do it and they're actually really really rare and, and they're worth going over the cliff for for me but. You have to maintain your dynasty roster, and if your your whole of your roster is looking a little old, a little shambly, yeah, you can try to win for one more year. But winning is also always a lower odds proposition, even with that great older team. So you should be interested in maybe being getting out now, because I, I swear to God, in a year everyone will be talking about how no one realizes, but Tyreek's old. <laughs> Try sending offers like you can maybe try now, but you're going to find a decreased value no matter what the ranks are saying, yeah. um, or what Twitter is saying for that matter. Uh, so it's a reasonable time to consider it, but to the point Zach and I think I made, you don't have to, but it's worth considering right now because in a year it's going to be too late to consider it at all. I think personally, yeah. then you're just Thelma and Louising for sure metaphorically to be clear <laughs> just in case yeah. uh, pit supporter bowers andrews sound good sounds pretty good that's pretty good it could use a kittle could yeah. use a kittle okay <laughs> might as well but yeah throw take that in. take that kittle discount <laughs> uh good evening hat tip uh thank you very much uh to you gentlemen just a just a dummies here uh, with the current offense in Seattle, how can JSN deliver on high a uh, high hopes? I hope we have reasonable hopes. I I dither between being excited because no one's excited and concerned because his rookie year was okay, which is okay, but I want it good. Yeah. Um, Zach's got a very reasonable explanation and one we expected before the season started. But I said at the time, like I expect him to beat that expert. Like that's where I was. That's when if I put a guy wide receiver one and I feel and I say confidently as I did in this profile, I think you should be able to beat my reasonable expectations a little bit to make me excited. As it is, I'm just kind of towing the line. If anyone's selling for a first anywhere outside the top five, I'm interested. Inside the top, he's just not there for me anymore. Like that was an okay rookie season. I'm not one to go all in on it exactly. But yeah, the 106, 107, 108. Yeah, I like JSM pretty well in that range. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, I'd rather have him than anybody outside the top, whatever it is, the the eight. Like, the, like that's you know, once once we're down there, like whatever. I'd rather have JSN. I think in order for him to 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 deliver, he's got to play like he did at the end of last season. Yeah, and I think I think he that. will. Like I think he'll be fine. Um, and it's just like, a it's just a matter of, of targets and and receptions and and scoring. Like he's got to score. He didn't really do much of that this past. All year. he needs to do in terms of value arcs and career breakout arcs is finish inside the top thirty six, and he's still going to be someone we have to pay attention to. What he needs to do to maintain this value is finish inside the top twenty. Four just rough lines. What I what I really think he needs to do to pay off on my rookie like rank of him, or I missed a little bit here, 
and it's finished inside the top 12. Second year isn't the only year a player could do that. It's not a reasonable expectation, but it is the most common breakout year. And after the way he finished the year and how high I was him as a rookie, honestly, that's where I want him to be. And will he do that? That's why I'm walking the line a little bit. It seems like a tall order based on the entirety of last season, which is a little unfair to Zach's point. Um, but yeah, that's what he would have to do to really make me feel like my rookie rank paid off or I got a little wrong. I shouldn't have dithered on JSN and Addison being so close. I should have just had Addison over. I mean, yeah. That's, I mean, but, but that was kind of, I mean, when we talked about this last year, my, so I had JSN and Addison within half a point of each other in their overall, in their overall film grades. Addison just squeaked by him but to me the situation was really clearly addison and, and like i i was not expecting much out of jsn first half of the year which was kind of how it played out like he was much better in the second half of the year than he was in the first half of the year and like i expect him to be like pretty good like i don't know that he's going to be a world beater just to second year but like he saw 90 it was like 90 some 92 targets 94 targets last year like yeah i don't want it to be questionable whether he had a good season or not by the end of this year yeah. or i think i maybe missed a little bit it's that simple like if we have questions like was that good was that good enough then i don't think it was good enough it's kind of where i'm at if that makes it at all clear without putting like i need a thousand yards that kind of arbitrary line and um, like we should know whether he had a good season or not yeah. if he had a good season um in general where i'm at the rookies from the last two draft classes as good as they've been i'm not in on those young wide receivers right now i want the older players like third fourth year the proven players and the rookies from this class like when questions come up about wide receivers like Josh Downs, Tank Dell, um, that that I got right, feel like I did pretty well. And even Addison, I feel like he paid off as JSN. Even Puka Nakua, where I'm roughly at, is at value if I can reasonably do it. I want to get into Harrison Neighbors, or I want to go up and get Alan Ra and CD Lamb, or a reasonable trade for value if I get a Pittman, a Wilson, uh Devonte Smith, a DK Metcalf's a little under value right now. A Jalen Waddle plus a 25, 26 pick. That's roughly where I'm. Or move over to running back, move over time. And I'm, I'm selling younger wide receivers right now a little bit, which is not fun for as a dynasty player. I think I have to hand my card in when you do that. <laughs> I'm not allowed it anymore. But um, like, like I think there's some. I think everything I've said about the younger players this year, and they're going to be good, and they're going to have. Uh, great careers and we're going to be happy i don't see a reason to hate on them other than this isn't a particularly great trend year for second year or third year breakouts it's more third year fourth year breakouts this rookie class looks really good with a significant top tier and we could see rookie breakout they're not included in the breakout trends rookie break-ins are kind of a little more arbitrary they could easily break out this year and steal the thunder from some of the other year guys even if they do well that could have some value ramifications in terms of how easy they are to trade, how hard they are to trade. And there's some really interesting values out right now outside of the four or five names I just mentioned uh, or going up um, or going across uh, to this rookie draft. I, I think that's those are reasonable trades you can expect. I think they're solid. I think they have better solid outcomes in terms of the high variance of expectations and my lower expectations for second-year breakouts this year. Um, it's just pushing me in that direction. I haven't made too many of those trades yet, so I can't put that money where my mouth is. Mostly what I've accomplished is trading for Aaron Jones in, in several leagues. I managed to get Najee Harris in my Patreon league. I was pretty happy with that for a second round pick. It's mostly running backs that are falling for me right now. And it's, I, as I always caution, it's a really awkward time to trade for running backs. Like, uh, whoops, that guy's not going to do anything for me. Like <laughs> Before the season even starts, something happens in the draft and it turns out they're not good. Um, but yeah, that's most of what my trades have been looking at outside of trading for 25 and 26 picks in the DLF league and stuff like that where I'm more building. But yeah, yeah, I, I've sent Tank Dell out in a lot of different offers, which feels weird as a guy who was victory lapping 
a tank Dell. So I don't have Laura. I think it's still going to be pretty good. Um, but it's more about those trends I was talking about where I try and ride them a little bit because I'm not a genius and stuff. I just do what happens most time. And um, Scribbles, thanks, guys. I've tried to pivot to tight end or just hold. Yeah, and, and yeah, try other trades. But honestly, the way you're describing it, I think you just have on and raw. Um, that's probably where you're most comfortable. And don't be scared to have a good play. And you're saying that this orphan doesn't have very many good pieces. If you have anything for picks, even like second and third round picks in this class, once you get to a point where you're on the clock, there are going to be, especially in this class, there are going to be players Man. available that other people like. And all of a sudden you can turn that third on the clock into a second next year. And you yeah. gain value. Even like, you gain you gained that so like you can do that sort of thing um so exploit people who are doing what i do where i i buy on credit so yeah. oftentimes I, I, I have that tendency too like i have yeah. no picks this year because i traded them all last year and on and on and on yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, and so like you can exploit that scribbles but you have to do it when you're on the clock and when people are excited about the next big thing when all of a sudden they're they're there in the second round and troy franklin has fallen and they're like oh troy franklin was great i had troy Frank franklin top seven i don't but like that that sort of thing where there's a player available that people like but you know that at that range in the draft the chances of them hitting are not great and if you can move to the next year and and gain you know slots and gain value go from a third to a second go from a second to a, a first from a team that expects their first to be late those are all ways to gain value too like you can make the it's it's like the i admit this may be an urban legend but like there when when um ebay first came out there was the kid who traded a paperclip all the way up to get a house. And he was just, you know, he's just making the little trade, little trade, little trade. And all of a sudden he he had gone all the way up and, and that's kind of how you have to approach uh, an orphan where like, it's not always sexy. It's not always the big splashy trades, but you can, you can get there by making small trades and winning. Sure. Yeah, just look to make little moves. And also, it's easier on the clock. Some yeah. people find. I find it worse on the clock. But honestly, that's very... I, I'm well, a weaker trader, I mean, right? E even, if um, it's not on, even if it's not on the clock, like just before, like during the draft, they'd be like... Oh, well, the look. draft thing, yeah. it's a good time for trade offers to be starting to zip around, get involved in that. Um, I was going to say, I, I have a player on several rosters that this is happening. I'm just holding. I'm like, ah, I would love to do something with it, but it just doesn't seem the right right time. And it's Jalen Waddle. I have him two or three places. One team I'm more building. One team I'm more competitive. I've sent out offers with him, and, and it's just not working. So I'm just like, I just have Jalen Waddle. Uh, and that's okay. That is okay. And um, sometimes I feel most nervous about my, and I have to say that, because I feel most nervous about my lack of activity. I'm like, ah, a good player will be doing more right now. And it's, you can end up doing worse for your team, you know? Like, look, and you have. And just nothing's happening right now. And the other thing, and the way I've got myself to learn that or start practicing that is you can deaden the trade market for a player if you send too many offers with that player or for that player, for that matter. Like, you can make it harder to get rid of that player or trade that player fairly in your league, or you can make it harder to trade for a specific player if you send too many offers because the guy gets tired of rejecting them. The whole league gets tired of hearing about it or constantly on the waiver wire or on the trade bait, they he starts to get the stink of someone that's an overvalued or undervalued or no one wants to trade for. It's this weird, I think, psychological aspect to being in that league. Or literally, you can just annoy the person. And they're like, oh, they just, they just auto-reject at this point, you know? So it's quite often a good idea just to try a little bit. And then if nothing happens, just write it out. You got, I'm wrong. You're doing pretty well. That's okay. That's okay. Yeah. 
or Jalen Waddle in my case. This time of year, uh, yeah. every rookie, Justin Jefferson, absolutely. Actually, every rookie is the guy who just hit. So who's the next Nakua? Who's but yeah, yeah, same thing. I do love this wide receiver class. It is a strong one. Uh, but veterans are never respected this time of year, which is what we try and take advantage of, which is like, which is why I'm like, where is Smith's value right now? Wilson, Too not low. really a veteran, yeah. yes, but um, Pittman even is in a pretty good breakout year. Ayuk has got way too big a fan club for me not to believe the person rostering him is in that fan club. But yeah, he's in that uh, area too right now. George Pickens is a fan club issue as well. So, um, but those are a few of the names that have popped up for me. Superflex team, I have Burrow, Dak, Rogers, and the 101. It's pretty good. Uh, it just doesn't feel optimal. I know I have two of those QBs on my bench every week, assuming I go Caleb. Uh, what would you do here? It's okay to have more than good quarterbacks than you need. You don't know. Rogers is a strong question mark. You have two and then a maybe. Like yeah. you, you don't have three definite top four starters here. And Dak's a maybe at this point, actually. And it looks like they're setting him up to fail, to be honest with you. Um, so yeah, that strength can disappear mighty fast, even at quarterback. Um, with certain players, and I think you all, I, I wouldn't get too overconfident. I like those players in terms of their fantasy outcome, at least, um, and two of them just as people. But, <laughs> um, yeah, that, that that's the first thing that jumps out to me. Two of those could look really rough in six months, if you know what I mean. Eight months, yeah. Twelve, twelve, four. And what would I, what would I do here? I don't see anything on that list that makes me think this is a plan of action I would take. Outside of the fact you don't have any of my top five quarterbacks, dude. I, and I want one of those guys. So I might tear up, if at all possible, because I'm always interested in doing that. Um, in fact, right now, you can go to a top three with Hurts, Allen, and, uh, and Mahomes. Mahomes. You have the firepowers to get there. More than enough firepower just on this little list you gave me, if you're interested in that. But you don't have to be. You're pretty solid and deeper at the position. Um, you could sidestep to a younger player with Stroud, but he doesn't really have that in his range. He has pretty. He has this in his range of outcomes. Too fair to me. I think Justin Herbert's falling right now. He's interesting, but I think he's going to keep falling. I don't think this season. This season might bring more value opportunities, so I'm not desperate for it. But yeah, the things I'm thinking of are things I'm generally thinking of in Dynasty, and if they're available in your league, I always investigate it. But there's nothing about your team creation here that makes me think you definitely have to trade away one of these QBs, and I would try and mush two of them together into a better tier quarterback if possible, but you don't have to force that. And with a 101, you'd, I would draft Caleb Williams, whether I make a trade or don't. Like, well, and and the other part draft, about having like having the depth that you have at quarterback and drafting Caleb Williams means that you don't necessarily have to rely on Caleb Williams coming out of the gate and being a top, you know, ten quarterback. Like he can kind of have that growth because not every quarterback comes in and CJ Stroud's right off the back. Even the even the Sorry, good quarterbacks, <laughs> and and if he does. That allows you the ability to now all of a sudden look at your roster, reevaluate, and say, "Okay, do I want to send Dak uh, and and pick up a wide receiver or that sort of thing with depth, or do I want to take Burrow and add a pick and tear up to, like Peter said, one of those quarterbacks, whether it's Allen or Mahomes or Hertz, that you know that sort of thing where you you have the flexibility because you have this depth." To, to kind of wait and see what Caleb Williams is, and Caleb Williams will dictate then how you pivot from there. But it's not necessarily a, a, a not like you don't have to make a move now, even though, yeah, you have two of those quarterbacks on your bench. Sure. But having two of those quarterbacks on your bench allows you the ability to wait for Caleb Williams and also allows you the flexibility to, if a, somebody in your league has a quarterback that gets hurt, you can go buy something off their roster for one of your quarterbacks who's expendable. The other, the other piece 
of this is, and I don't know exactly your league, you might be able to take Dak and go toward like a Kyler. Like Kyler Murray is so undervalued right now. It's not even funny. Um, And then make a move or a burrow for Kyler plus like that sort of thing. That's a better answer than Herbert, where I think that might continue to fall a little bit. Whereas Murray's yeah, you're right. Murray's way too low a little bit. So, I, I mean, I, I, that's just kind of how I see it is, is I don't mind Chris, you, you having the four quarterbacks because one of them, maybe two of them, Rogers and, and Caleb Williams are kind of unknown. Even though, like, Rodgers has been great. Like, Rodgers, Jets, like, this is all still kind of in flux. Burrow coming back off the injury, you're going to be able to have two starting quarterbacks. What quarterbacks you're starting is is a little bit in flux, but once you figure that out, then you have the ability to kind of pivot and continue to bolster your roster because you have that depth. And with all that in mind, this is one of the ways that looking at my league's rosters helps me the most. That's where I look for ideas. You might find, you might not like Kyler Murray. I think you should, but whatever. Maybe you love Justin Herbert or someone else. But you might go look at rosters and you find that the guy, the roster with that quarterback you would rather have than Dak or Burrow, that's all they have. And you've got depth. And you can suddenly add Rogers to one of them and get the guy that you much prefer, if you know what I mean. Or you go look at your rosters and you're fine. Wow, this guy only has CJ Stroud. And you're like, that's interesting to me because I have depth, but two of them are a little older. That looks set up to fail a little bit. Uh, I don't, I think he's a very good quarterback. He should be okay, but still. Um, or you might find like, that you find things on the rosters where you see an opportunity for you to use what you have to make a good offer to them that helps them out with something they have or don't have that can really work with what you have or don't have. And that's where I get better ideas. I don't have generic. I've got Burrow, Jack Rogers on the one one too many quarterbacks. What do I do X? I see four great things on your roster at different values to be fair. Let's see what else is in my league. And that's where I get most of my trade ideas from. As a, a weaker trader, I find that has more positive effects than trying to create X plus Y equals G or whatever in terms of trades because I just can be less reliant on getting those done. Whereas if I find a little team that works with my roster, makes a solid trade offer, pushes me in the direction I prefer, I find that works. And, and by the way, this is entirely unnecessary. We're not motivated by it. Um in terms of we're actually just happy, we're motivated by talking with you, my dude. We do appreciate it. Don't get me wrong. But just in case, like, we'll talk to you regardless of this. Like, uh, it feels like we, it's almost rare these days. We're actually here to engage and talk about Dynasty, not to make money off the matter. But we really do appreciate it. I, I did figure out where that stuff goes, by the way. When it hits the YouTube because now I'm only on my usual. You have to make a certain amount a month for them even to pay out. And then when we hit that number, it pays out to me. And then I offer to split it with Zach and Russ. And they go, no. And it sits in my PayPal account to go to spend it. That's where it goes. So I did figure it out. <laughs> um, but And that's why it wasn't going anywhere. It didn't seem to be. It's not that DLF was taking it. it, it uh, you have to get over a certain amount, which I definitely don't do on a monthly basis. And so it adds up until it hits that amount. And then it's like, hey, you got $100. Oh, cool. Cool, cool. Ah. For anyone that has been on past streams where I pretend that it goes to nowhere, that's actually where it was ending up. Uh, what's new on the prospect spectrum? Right now, just finished my tight end prospects. Um, and I'm pretty comfortable with my ranks right now. I'm going to go reread my notes, maybe spell check a few of them because they're not very much spell check. Uh, and re update. Um, and then just try to pay. Right now, I'm not paying attention. There's very little going on as far as I can see that I need to add. But I'm trying to pay attention for players I haven't heard about and um, players I may have underrated or undervalued or made to look at a little deeper and um, just for areas to go through and tweak or maybe add a rank or two before the draft gets here. Um, and enjoy, honestly. I mean, I'm, I'm making fun of the content right now, but I enjoy reading and listening just to Dynasty and Fantasy stuff. And also, this is where you get to hear players' stories. 
And since I've done my ranks now, I'm not overly influenced by the blue of their collar or the toughness of their lives, I guess. Not that that matters because it's meant to be fun. But um, I, I, I like rooting for these guys. And so I'm really enjoying the stories coming out, seeing players live their best life. Those first round touted prospects getting to visit teams after all that hard work, feeling their dream on the cusp. That's that's fun. That's enjoyable to me to uh, to watch. And I'm going to keep enjoying those arcs. That's honestly what's newest for me on the prospect tour. I should get paid. I should get to pay attention to the prospects now. <laughs> Whereas Zach's like, I've been grinding eight hours of film. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've got the 101, 103, 104, and I love Bowers with the 104. That'd be a great pick. Uh, but worried about landing spot for the for a tight end. I try not to talk landing spot too much. What you should know about taking even Brock Bowers is the Kyle Pitts thing. Now, I actually think he's a better prospect in some ways, like we've talked about, um, than uh, Kyle Pitts was, cause, especially as Kyle Pitts' value went hella nuts before rookie drafts even, like stupid high before rookie drafts even started, or when they started, maybe. Um, so that was a different story. But the 104 is a very fair place to play for Pitts or Brock Bowers. You know, just spending the one high pick instead of multiple high picks, which is where his value eventually came. Um, but what you should know is that there is a weirdness on the longevity of the arc of Titan. Not all of them, David and Joku, where they do nothing and then suddenly three top 12 seasons and it's uh, it's okay. Or get an injury year like Travis Kelsey and then become Travis Kelsey. Not all of them start off year one being Hall of Fame worthy. Like I think that's what Gronk did and Jimmy Graham was pretty close behind. But what you do know is because there are so few of them that hit that hard, you don't know what to expect. If you know what I mean? So if we go into game one and he's Sam Laporta, good. If he comes into game one and he does nothing, you know nothing. It could still be good. Yeah. <laughs> Expect that the range of outcomes of what his good career could look like is very wide. Um, you have to be comfortable with that to make the pick or trade it or take someone else you feel is confident. Because it could well be you don't see a target from Brent Bowers to week 12, and then it's like a three-yard out and nothing happens without it. Like I honestly don't know what to expect from a rookie tight end who will be one of – because. It's very few, and they've all had very different starts. Sam Laporta is the most convincing, I guess, that I've seen in quite a while. Um, so, yeah, that's what I would say. If you're going to make the pick, don't worry about the landing spot so much. Ask yourself the question of if you're willing to hold it after seeing relatively little after year one, because tight end is the position we should expect that the most. Maybe quarterback's pretty close, but tight end, definitely. And, Zach, do you... Tight end is weird. Like maybe you can be a yeah. little more in tune to whether the offense is geared so, towards that type of play. Like tight end's a very particular position. Well, but also I generally am staunchly opposed to taking tight ends in the first round you know, of rookie drafts. Right. Famously, the actually. The, the, the caveat to that is when the the fantasy community pushes a tight end up as highly as Pitts was and as highly as Bowers will be, Bowers will be, you have the ability to take them and trade them for more than what you paid for them like immediately. So it's that not one. even, <laughs> it's not even necessarily about, and I like, I like Bowers and I'm toying with the idea of taking Bowers at this level, but, by the same token, it's going to be really hard to pass up. Like if if quarterback goes one, actually, uh, and I two. might even like if I had the one hundred one, the one hundred three, and the one hundred four, I'd probably take Marvin Harrison one hundred one, <laughs> and and then yeah. take whichever quarterback fell to one hundred three, and then I would probably take neighbors at one hundred four, unless it's a one point seven five, like unless it's a big premium in tight end, I I, I would probably take neighbor because. Again, looking at this class, Marvin Harrison Jr. is the third highest grade I've given out for film since 2017. Malik Neighbors is nine. Like you have two top 10 players. The only other class that I've watched since 2017 that has two top 10 players in it 
was the Justin Jefferson CD Lamb class. That may not be true. They may have been. I may have had Rondell Moore up that high, so it was Rondell Moore and, and <laughs> Chase too. Do. But but yeah, <laughs> but but it's not like it's not a. It's pretty rare to have this level of players at that position. But also, like Bowers is really good. So like, I, and Peter, I agree with you. Dave, don't worry about the landing spot. Worry about how tight end kind of evolves into being successful. I, I would say not the landing. I don't even know the landing spot is an important, Dave, to be real clear. I, I feel pretty confident in that uh, wide receiver and running back. I think I, I, there's different trends there. With tight end, I honestly don't know. Like, there's just too few of them to be fully confident. I, I yeah. think it's okay not to worry about it too much, but you also have a list of things to be worried about that I think preempt it. One, like just being comfortable with that. You could take neighbors and be very comfortable with that. How you make that decision, there's no, I don't think there's a hundred percent way. Personally, I, the reason I was a little bit more confident because neighbors is, I really like neighbors. Neighbors should be great. Not just good, should be great. Yeah. Um. But like the way I'm justifying it is if if you tell me everyone hits their multiple their top outcome, like just a hyperbole. One's Gronk, one's Calvin Johnson, right? Like there's no miss there. But I think Gronk, you, you can make a stronger effort for Gronk being the rarer pick, you know. Overall, like not that there's ever been another Calvin Johnson. There's been a Julio, you know. Yeah. Whereas you've got Gronk, and in the same period, you've got maybe Graham. Just close, neck and neck here and there, but mostly it was just Gronk. Kelsey? Let's face it. Like a decade later. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Um, and th and that's I mean, not, like well, I say, I'm not. Yeah, there's there, the answer. I'm like, the, that's how I'm rationing through it. The, but honestly, that's feather in this, like that's. I don't know. I have confident. I can feel in that there, reasoning. <laughs> there was another. There was a. There was. A, we don't speak. Is we don't speak about him. But there was another tight end in the Gronk that's, Jimmy that's Graham true. class yeah. that was. I mean, he like Aaron Hernandez Very and sad. Gronkowski were just ridiculous together. That's true. Yeah. But, yeah. No. But yes, no, I agree. Like yes. the, the and tight end is the tight end. I can't tell you there shouldn't have been three others actually, huh. and now we'll get that. I don't yeah. know. It's a very weird position, but probably not. Um but yeah, take the quarterbacks. You should probably take those two wide receivers over Bowers. That's where I have it I would rank it in my head right now, to be honest. Um, but and that that's why I keep saying Bowers at five is a pretty good pick. Um, I feel more confident in Bowers than any of the running backs. I wouldn't take a third wide receiver over him, even if I do have Xavier Worthy there. And I, I, no, I wouldn't consider the third quarterback, and I don't really know much about who the third quarterback would be, and it's meant to be a strong quarterback class. Um, so that's how you probably should think of it. But you're already voting for Bowers over that, and I'm not discouraging that either. Like, I would be tempted because of the shallow, but... I think interesting reasoning I just had. The other thing is, the only other note I have on any idea of what to do, really interesting to speculate, don't want to discourage it, but always keep that asterisk on of don't become too set on an idea because the draft will happen and Bowers goes 101 or he goes in the third round and suddenly you have an entirely different landscape. And I found myself, if I plan out my draft too succinctly, I get that idea in my head. It's a little hard to harder to adjust. Fun to think about, but I'm going to keep doing it. But just remember, like, Neighbors goes in the third round for some weird-ass reason, and suddenly there's something else to consider. And it's it's easier to adjust if you don't set. At least don't set the picks, you know? Yeah. <laughs> you know? It's the only other thing I think to add to that. Good advice, guys. Thanks. Good, bad, relative. But, you know, I had fun talking about it with you. Hopefully you found something to think about. And I like hearing what Zach has to say, as always. Um, thanks for the question to do that. What's the Bowers targets only being screens? What's with Bowers? Wait, uh, wait, see, I, don't, I don't think that's <laughs> necessary. Like, I do think that they try to get him the ball in space a lot because he is a yak monster. That's like, what I was gonna say. <laughs> but, but also, you have a like, guy adding nine yards, yeah, just but, but, the ball. But he also, like, he also 
is able to go downfield. He's able to high point, even though he is only 6'3". He is able to find soft spots in the zone. Like he, he just does literally everything that you could possibly want except for be 6'5". Yeah, I was gonna say he can't be six five, and he can't. Yeah, be like I mean, give him some platform shoes. <laughs> and he can't have a forty time. I'm just, I'm just a few things, which are actually very small things. To be oh, fair. I'm pretty sure good I'm, tight I'm ends pre- are running a little smaller of late. To be fair, I'm and, pretty and the, sure again he's where fast. we have smaller samples that the, the two fifty six three six five thing is always you know yeah no go greener. It's fine. Ingram a bit smaller. <laughs> Jared Everett didn't die on the field, that kind of thing. Is Drake London and Bajon Robinson too much Atlanta? I'm like, no, not really. Wow. I think London might be too much Atlanta on your dynasty team. I, I, he's not, again, younger players at wide receiver are a little dubious to me right now. Not dubious, but I'm more interested in moving into more certain assets or speculating further into other yet to be the, drafted players at the, the position in general. But. The difference, though, so there's going to be a ton of hype on London and, because yeah. of Cousins going to. So I might sell London based on the, the temperature of the community, but I also think that there's something to that where Drake London is in a situation this year to actually succeed. I think they will throw more. With Kirk Cousins there, solid. because it's... Kirk Cousins is a better thrower than anybody they've had in Atlanta. And I, I also think that they will have a better overall offense than they've had. And so, like, London hasn't been bad within the context of that offense. It, it, but I think he's still overvalued. Like, he's still overvalued, but I don't like, mind I, rostering I him. You... I think you could scooch across from London at the right temperature whenever it gets to the right temperature in the community or your league to like scooch over to a Wilson or a Lave yeah. or, or one of those guys, pretty much the same, same class and get a plus. I'm like, they've done more. I like that, you know, yeah. but you know, it's very, what's the trade kind of a thing. I'm not telling you desperately so London, <laughs> but I, I dangle it. Uh, 10 teams who feel like start 11. Uh, half point tight end premium wide receivers were Chase Lamb. Okay, shut up. Chase, right. JJ, and Lamb and Rice. Why not? Tight end was Andrews, Pitts, McBride. Trade away JJ and McBride for AJ Brown. Don't mind that right now. AJ Brown's another one of those ones and an interesting value. Yeah. Dell, uh, 125 first. I can't read that. 125. Mid. Mid first, a, a, 20, a 25, 126 mid. first, yeah, and Dell. Yeah. And then I have 426 first and 125. First. Yeah, you're building out. Um, what the only thing I'm worried about here is you're selling youth for you're selling value for value, and you're getting yeah. pretty good. You know what I mean? You've sold good players, and what you've got is mystery picks that are t- in most cases two years out. We might be going a little too far down the road. Like you can bring some of those back to 25. That'd be nice. And I don't think this trade is bad at all. Like I like it, but don't get too far in the weeds. Otherwise you become that dynasty player. That's only got players that are yet to be rostered kind of a thing. That whole meme, the minute they're good, sell them. Um, But this trade was solid. I think JJ and McBride though. Really? Yeah. It feels like a lot. I, I know you got AJ Brown back, but it feels like a lot to, and a um, first of the first. Yeah. I think it feels like a lot that. to give up to to get young to get younger in the 26 class, which like I and you've I, now made yourself to, less competitive to do it. Like you've yeah. built before you needed to build, but you are but a, yeah. I don't want to be too negative, but I think you pushed it a little too dynasty here. You, you're managing your value very well, but you let that points per game slip just a little bit too far. When really, this is a goal. Don't forget, we can redraft it any given time. Don't tempt me. We're going to try and win. And you've pushed yourself further away from where it would be tempting. Not that AJ Brown is, <laughs> is bad. Like, I don't think that's a really good acquisition right now. But you went a little too hard in the paint. But you did. But value, the solid thing about value is you now have more yeah. options for more years. But it would have been nicer to be closer to that points per game point, especially with and, these young players. But you've got Chase, so you are. Well, and that, like that, the half point premium to me 
all, all like Andrews Pitts and McBride could all be starting like I'm in your starting lineup. Point. Yeah. So trading away McBride, like, yeah, you got AJ Brown. You're hoping Dell comes back healthy and is Dell, but I I still think that McBride it, with a half point premium could outscore Dell. But so I think, like, fair, I think Richard, I, yeah. No, okay. I don't know. The, the, it, the, 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 sorry, it's late. We gotta go. Uh, I was just going to say, you're not done. <laughs> it's not like you've made this trade. Now you're in this situation. Those are, those would have been my notes on it before you made it, but you've made it, and it's fine. You are not you don't stop now. You go get Laporta. You go add points somewhere else. You have all these value, shiny value things, so you can continue to make moves. So I don't want to deaden this trade in the water. And don't stand still. You're making moves. It's cool. It sounds fun to me. Uh, Chris K, much appreciated. You guys gave me a lot to think about, and I hadn't considered. That's why you're the best in the biz. The guy I see grind biz, maybe. Uh, but no, I, re I really appreciate it, Chris. If you didn't come and talk to us, we'd have it'd just be me and Zach, which I would enjoy. I would say it's still be fun, but it's it's even more fun with the yeah, with the more people's more the chat. Yes, yeah. it, it, it sends us down an avenue that I wouldn't have thought to go down. Honestly, this is why this is fun. Uh, Richard Davis, other big uh, trade, 10 teams who flex, half point tight end premium, start 13, had Alan Hurts and Stroud, uh, trade away Stroud, for, you're doing a really yeah. good job drafting, dude, like uh, you've built good teams here, um, like, it, sometimes it's okay, but anyway, trade away Stroud for DJ Moore and Carr, and the 102, I like that, and the one, oh okay, I like it again, there you go, <laughs> yeah. I should keep reading to the full stop. Caleb Harrison thoughts. Yeah, the 102 makes that trade for me. Um, it's a really important part of that trade. And, and I actually think you came out slightly ahead. Caleb, yep. you're pretty even with just having yeah. Stroud, let alone DJ Moore and Carr on top. It's not much. Carr isn't much of a plus, but he's a plus and DJ Moore. Pretty good. Yeah, I like it. So that's a, a solid win. And not to mention, like you point out, could be Caleb, could be Harrison, could be a trade. So yeah, that's the thing about a pick right it could be made the, the can still be traded could be anything could be could be a boat we don't <laughs> know but in dynasty that she matters for something it's more tradable to more teams and more situations you can do so much more so yeah and I, I think that one's just a solid win no, no notes it's that's the kind of trade where my heart I immediately went negative because you were trading away a good year rookie player at a position that normally isn't a good year rookie player, Stroud. And I was like, this has got to be bad. But you actually found a really good trade, man. That's good. Yeah, it's the the like fungibility has value. So getting that pick, being yeah. able to, yeah, you got that flexibility. Non fungible, there. my butt. Fungible is where it's at. That's the one. <laughs> Genji, who's interested in the tight end landscape? There's actually a few this year. It's not as good as last year. Brock Bowers makes it up by himself even compared to last year, despite what Sam yeah. Laporta did, because he's a lot more easy to identify. Laporta's um, think... pretty easy to identify. Come on. No, uh, Come they're on. all easy to identify as a different different type of class as well. But like you would put Brock Bowers at one in that class, right? Uh, oh that yeah, Brock Bowers is the highest That's, grade. It's the, really like, the difficult to get above the yeah. and yeah. Yeah, and he does yeah. it pretty yeah. confidently. That's yeah. what I mean by it. Um, but there isn't like last year. I had three or four prospects. I was like, I am taking shots of tight end this year. <laughs> and this year, I'm like, what can I do to get to the Bowers pick? Sanders is pretty interesting. Like he yes. would be the tight end one. I think in most draft classes, if it wasn't last year, wasn't this year, Sanders would yeah. be a really interesting one. Then there's a few. Tier two, like I would take a shot in the second or third, depending on who was left on the board. Um, but you know, they often end up being Brevin Jordan, yeah. so like that's where we're at with the classes. Bowers, Sanders is pretty interesting. Then there's a few I will take shot, but not like last year. I'm not defaulting to it, like go get the tight ends. That was last year, yeah. And this year's like ah, the, the running back, you know, like it's gone, maybe, maybe it's funny because I, 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 I took this. Not as rookies, but as because that's how like sometimes my brain does the and like again I think like Fry Fryermuth has dropped to a point where he's really interesting. Michael Mayer is really interesting, and Tucker Mayer's Craft 
like those like those three guys are the tight ends that I want to acquire outside of the rookies that you just mentioned with Bowers and Sanders. Like it's, it's interesting, Mayor flags for you too. I've been thinking I I, I put in a few trades. Also, um, the Luch lower value, but yeah. because we we're excited coming into this year and he was just hurt. I'm like, there's a like an injury discount on the upside, which is not yeah. guaranteed or anything, but there's like an injury discount on the risk reward bet that was to luch. I don't mind that. Mayor stands out. Um, because of the young versus the old in the top five right now, I think you can find some interesting ideas on Kittle. Or yeah. Andrews? Like, Kel- is Kelsey still the tight end one versus Laporta? Sometimes the fact that Andrews is in that mix gets lost. Probably not to the guy rostering him in your league, right? But maybe. And I, I think Andrews could be interesting. I think most answers to this question are going to be around Kyle Pitts, and I'm still not there. <laughs> I'm not there. He's too fan clubby. Um, so, yeah, yeah, some similar names. What signs that's with Zach? I'm, I'm happy to hear Faramuth come out your mouth hole there, Zach. That makes me happy. Hmm. It's a nice change. <laughs> it's all about value. So it's all about the ADP, Peter. Yeah, yeah, I'm not going to throw more names on there. Then we're just naming players. I think those ones stand out. Hey, Joanna. I, uh, person turquoise writing headphones. I agree. It's like a Miller <laughs> analogies test. <laughs> it was like it's a test and I'm failing. <laughs> um, uh, I will gladly take a Nunze over Bowers. Okay. Uh, sad face. I, yeah, I, not, I wouldn't. Not, I, I will not. Draft hasn't happened, but I wouldn't take any but the two wide receivers over him. That's where I'm at. And I really like that tier of wide receivers. To be clear, you should like Anunze. He's pretty good. I I don't put him in that tier, but um, that's fine. He's pretty good. You should be pretty happy with Anunze. I would take, right now, I'd take Thomas and Worthy over him, but I'd be be looking at Anunze in that range too. But this is the type of class where because I think Worthy will fall, like if I have multiple picks in the first, like I'll, I'll take, like I'll either take Odunze or trade back right. and still get the players that I want and get value or take Odunze because I don't think that he's bad. I think he's very good. And I, I will, go, it's, it's kind of like the, uh, the, a couple of classes ago where, you, where you had Olave, but I wanted Wilson, but like I'm still going to draft Olave. And a lot of people like the lave, and I'm like, it's not a, it's not a, oh, the lave is terrible. It's a, I prefer Wilson, but if I can get both of them, I, yeah, I'll do yeah. that. So, yeah, I, I'm, a, I, I've done that to my wife a lot. I'll send her emojis on my phone. There's something about our phones where they don't translate. And the other day, she was like, "Why do you keep sending me little tiny X's?" <laughs> I was like, that, "That was a thumbs up. You didn't see that? No, I've just been sending like XXX, which is not what I meant." <laughs> um, we're close. We're uh, no, no, no. Let's not do that. Don't do that. Don't do, don't do several that. tiers don't do of that. separation Pers- yeah, as do. prospects, but yeah, you know, okay, don't do that unless unless He's you're saying good. that he will drop balls in preseason, <laughs> and then maybe. <laughs> but all right, look over there. We're Thanks not doing well. it. You're doing it. You're on your own, Genji. You are on your own with Odunze Jamar Chase. We're cheering you, but we will not join you on that. Yeah, so I, I wish you much luck. Much luck. Yeah. All right. Look over there. 